begin the meeting of the June 10th, 2019 Plan Commission meeting, and we do have a quorum, so we can get started. Uh, the first order of business is the uh, consider approval of the Plan Commission minutes of May 6, 2019. I would entertain a motion to do so. I'll make that motion. The approval is submitted. Motion by Robinson. I'll second. Second by Caravello. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, the minutes carry. And that takes us to the uh, City Council representative report. And who would like to do that this evening? Mr. Caravello. Just, what do you want to report? Yeah, anything that why. came from here to the council that we took action on, and more than likely, if we did, it would have been in the minutes. So if you just look at the minutes, you can oh, kind of okay. highlight a couple things, or we can just move on to the agenda. Right. Nothing is jumping out at me as anything substantial that we took action on that I can recall. Everything that came from Planning Commission was approved by council in the same form. Um, and then we would go on to our staff report, and that would be uh, <coughs> Director Shield. Contained in your packet is the monthly report outlining some of the status of some of the current projects. Um, as, as I can report, we've had some progress on the 400 South Van Buren Street project. We've gotten some additional paperwork submitted, another application for a revision to some stormwater features on that site. So we hope to be able to see that one come to closure in the not too distant future. Any questions about the report? Hearing none, we'll move on to item number five, which is a request by Tim Thorson for approval of a preliminary condominium plat for a Stoughton Hospital. And is there anything we want to cover before we go into the public hearing? Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction. Uh, this, <coughs> this facility this is not a part of a new construction of another building or to create uh, apartments. Um, the, the, condominium concept is something that some are um, confused about and wanting to collaborate and let them know that it's not related to an additional construction. It's really about separation of the facility in ownership manner, much like um, commercial entities and or residential entities that have separate ownership of the tenant, uh, the, the individual spaces. Uh, that's what their hope is to do here for the hospital facility as well. This map just illustrates uh, the primary three units of the facility on the campus, and um, that w that's the primary purpose, to separate out ownership opportunities for this parcel. Are there any questions before we get started? So what we're going to do is we haven't noticed uh, we have to have a public hearing. So what we do is we close our regular meeting, and then we reopen it for the public hearing. And I don't have anyone signed up to speak on this topic, but certainly anyone in the audience is welcome to come up to the microphone and speak on this particular topic if you wish. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and then we'll reopen for the regular meeting. And what we're looking for is a recommendation to the City Council. So are there any questions that you have about the material in your packet? Uh, relating to the hospital's um, plan. I just have a, is there any potential as their necessity for doing this, is there anything potentially where they'd be splitting up ownership of the, the, these three units from Stoughton Hospital into other ownership entities or? <coughs> There's a question of ownership of the entities of the tenant spaces here. Um, there's representatives from the hospital as well as the surveyor that's available to answer that question, but it certainly would be a possibility. So. Okay. No, there's no separation. Okay. Hospital own everything. Okay. You guys know Tim. Right. I think he's been here under your own property in the past, but you're here representing the hospital yep. on this one. Okay. Any other questions while he's at the podium? or concerns that you have? Okay. 
Otherwise, um, if you're okay with the proposal, we'd be looking for uh, a recommendation to the City Council. Of the resolution that's in your packet. Yeah, there's a resolution in the packet. Um, so I would entertain a motion for that resolution. So moved if that's okay. The question. All right, it is. So there's a motion by uh, Seltzer. Is there a second? A second. Second by Robinson. Any uh, discussion or questions on the resolution? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Item number six is a request from Chris Gentili for a conditional use permit approval to expand the two-family use in-family suite at 224 South Van Buren Street. This one's also noticed for a public hearing. Uh, Director Shield, would you like to give us some background on this one? As part of the conditional use process, uh, there's a public hearing associated with this. Uh, the gentleman is interested in creating an in-family suite on the upper level of this two-story and would be a, th a third story facility or third level for this um, dwelling in f in family suite it would be an expansion of the two family used to accommodate um, a, a relative to live on the third floor if you will of this facility we'll talk about issues or questions after the public hearing okay. any questions leading up to the public hearing <coughs> Seeing none, we'll close our regular meeting and then we'll reopen for the public hearing. And I do have uh, one person signed up to speak, and that would be uh, Julie Dixon. Is Julie here? You can come up to the microphone here. And you can adjust the mic if you'd wish. Okay. Thank you for coming here. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm Julie Dixon. Uh, my husband, Steve Dixon, and I own the property directly adjacent to the house on uh, Van Buren that's asking for this conditional use. Uh, I didn't come with a prepared statement, so I'm going to briefly touch on some of the things I, in my letter of May 22nd. And that's that first, my first point, if the attic is going to be turned into a suite within an apartment, will it have its own entrance? If it does have its own entrance, does that make this a three-unit building? Um, and if it doesn't have its own entrance, what happens to this suite when the current tenants move out? Will it then be a short jump to making this a three-unit building? My main concern about this is the parking congestion. If you've been to the house, you know <laughs> that this house is already an awkward one for parking. It's a small corner lot. Three sides of it are almost completely inaccessible. It's cramped by close neighbors on the west. It has a high abutment on the south. And to the east is a stoplight, a steep hill, and two blocks of no parking zone. That leaves only our property on the north for overflow parking. Am I going to be dealing with people parking on my lawn because there's no parking in front of this house for the extra people that are going to be living in that house? As a, my husband and I have been landlords for over 30 years, one thing that he likes to, he likes to always remind me, every single unit that you rent, you have to account for two cars every single unit if you own a two flat that's four cars that you have to allow for are we going to be now dealing with six cars in this property with no place to park so that's why i'm opposed to this that's why we're both opposed to the conditional use permit okay thank you for coming in and the applicant is here if there's questions okay um, is there anyone else that would wish to speak? Okay, we just ask you to state your name and your address for the record. Okay, I'm Chris Gentile. I'm the owner of the property. Um, I live in Fitchburg, 5712 Barbara Drive. 
Um, right now there's one person in one unit, uh, another person in, this, in the family in another unit, so there's only two cars. There's a two-car garage. There's parking for two more cars on the property, so I'm not sure what the parking problem would, would be. I mean, there's no, not going to be any parking problem. So I don't understand what she's talking about. Okay. Well, thank you for coming up. Is there anyone else wishing to speak at the public hearing? If not, we can close the public hearing and then we'll reopen for our regular business. And then, did you have anything you wanted to add, Director Sheeler, or would you like to see if there's any questions? Or? I certainly field some questions, but I, I certainly had some observations about the questions that were raised. And one was related to the exiting out of the third level. Uh, any living space above the second floor requires two exits. Um, the plan that's been submitted to date hasn't been um, supplied that shows two exits to grade. So certainly a plan would have to be developed and approved for a building permit prior to that happening. Um, secondly, um, I don't think it would be uh, unreasonable to uh, have just a little more effort put into the parking layout plan to ad at least address the concern that was raised. There certainly there's a dimension plan there, but just outlining how the parking configuration might be positioned on that parking area as well as the, the uh, driveway would probably be suitable. And lastly, uh, this is intended to be an in-home in family suite. Um, the application indicates that as such, um, it seems that there might be a reasonableness to place a deed restriction on the property that would denote that as such. Now the three items that I've raised um, could be handled in two ways. It, you might want to place them as conditions of approval or you could table action until su sufficient data is brought back to address uh, those few items if you desire so those at least try to address the com comments that were raised both by the written testimony and the verbal testimony okay. <clears throat> commissioners have any questions or comments or thoughts about how you'd like to approach this is the ingress regress ingress I really can't talk today <laughs> sorry um, is that the to the ground floor path is that exterior or interior uh, they only show one exit out of the third floor seeing right here yeah one ha have them come speak sure, um, come state building code has requirements about the exiting <coughs> requirements yeah, I haven't submitted the plan to Steve yet but there's right. a common entrance in the main hallway going all the way through up to the third floor and there'll be another exit coming out so there'll be two exits that, that plan hasn't been provided yet, correct? Correct. Okay. Does that answer your question, uh, Alder Mayor? I mean, there has to be two exits by law, so I mean. No, no question. Do you, do you have a plan as to how you to provide that to address the question as to whether that would go to grade or not and how that would um, be proposed? If you can see the, the picture, is that my picture? It's so, your picture, yes. Um, the upper left corner where there's like a little table right there, that's going to be coming out. There's a window right there. And then there's a porch on the second floor, so it's going to be coming down toward the porch where that stairway is going up to the, up to the attic. So it'll go down to a, a landing um, where there's a porch already uh, for the second exit. And the porch discharges to grade? Uh, the porch is on the second floor. Yeah, does that go to, to the ground? No, it doesn't have to go to the ground. So both exits would only discharge back to the, to the second well, the first floor. First exit would go all the way down to the ground. This one goes yep. all the way to grade. Correct. Um, and as far as the parking goes, the driveway itself is it must be 60 feet long, 70 feet long. I mean, there's room for 20 cars if, if we had to. I know you've been having some communications with Steve about the exiting. Is there is there a timeline for when that plans plan to be submitted so we can review it for compliance with the UDC code? What what, what do you need just the plan for the exit? You need to have a detail. Yes, you have to provide that plan, sure. and, and you're also familiar with the exit separation yep. requirements, correct? Yep. I own. I've done this with another property in Middleton. Yeah. Same exact thing. So, so what is the schedule to get the plan submitted so that it could be reviewed for compliance? Do you have a schedule for that? or Could I just use this plan and then show the second exit? I can't or? speak to what we we need to be able to review it for compliance. 
I, I, knowing this is an issue, I, we just don't have that plan from you. Mm -hmm. Well, I showed this to Steve, and he but, said, and he said you still need to have a complete plan, correct? correct? Yeah. So it would take me ten minutes to show him what I'm going to do. So. Anybody else have any questions? Um, so this, so eventually in the future, this could be used as a third rental unit. No, it's going to be it's part of the second floor. That's, that's, if you're not the owner and somebody else has it, could could it be used as a rental unit? Not under a zoning code, and other under the one suggestion I recommended was a, a deed restriction to be placed. At least you'd have that continuing. Um, Condition running with the property, okay. Commissioner. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Barman. Uh, and, uh, these may be dumb questions, but <laughs> I, in reading through the materials in advance of this meeting, I thought I saw a reference to the fact that these in-family suites were supposed to be um, accessed only through the other unit, but we're also talking about providing two exterior exits. That allow you to access this independent of that second floor unit. So I'm, I'm confused by the definition of an in-family suite because this appears to be a completely independent unit versus an in-family suite. The way this is laid out with the two completely, well, one completely separate exit and then the other is a second egress to the to the second floor balcony. Yeah, and, and you know that's the hard hard part of evaluating a conversation about where the exits go and to and from, yeah. and also evaluating the distances for separation. Those are things that we have to evaluate, and I, I can't do it on the fly here. So that is something I think we'd need to have before we. But in terms of a definition of an yeah. in-family suite, isn't the definition intended that you only access that through the, the other intention. units? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's that's not true. really an in-family suite. As long as there's, the door is not locked. Right. As, lock, as long as there's not a lock on the door. But, but it looks to me like you can access through the common stairwell all the way to Correct. the first floor. And then you have the, the secondary egress for emergency purposes to the second floor Correct. balcony. But it, the way this is laid out architecturally, it's laid out just like it's a third apartment. It's right in your language. It's right in the. I, 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 I can't, I'm not, I've been looking for the specific reference, but I thought the definition of in family suite was that the only access to the unit, the in family unit, was through the, the partnered units. So that the only access would be through that second floor unit, not independent of a common stairwell. I, I'm almost sure I read that, but I'm trying to find it on the fly here, and I'm not. I'm not seeing it. So I'm just trying to clarify the definition of an in-family suite. Okay. Can Can Mike speak to this? We've talked about it. As long as there's an unlocked door going going to it. What I recall, um, I don't. I don't think the definition takes into account the UDC requirement. For the the exiting from a, from a third floor. Okay, so there's two That's, things at play. There's here. two things that yeah that come okay. into play. And when we're talking about the unlocked door. Where is the unlocked door in this particular case? It's six feet away from the, um, the door going to the second floor apartment. So if I walked into the first floor stairwell, I could go all the way up to the third floor and just access that third unit because that that door is not going to be locked at the top of the stairs. Correct. My a, a secondary question, and this is just again because we're kind of setting the precedence here, <coughs> is um, if if someone had a unit like this, a a, a house with a, a first floor flat, a second floor flat, and wanted to create a kind of um, unique living space for a family member, is it necessary to go through the, the um, process of creating a truly defined in-family suite? And if I just put in a second kitchen in the unit, or if I just put in another bedroom, and the, this is kind of their space, because there's not a locked door in between. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, why is there a requirement here that we define this as a an official in-family suite that then now creates this need to have something official? Versus just having a, a unit with two kitchens, for example. And again, these may be dumb questions. Yeah. But. No, I, I don't think they're dumb questions. This is our first one that we are experiencing. Uh, the zoning code is written such that we're trying to, to flesh through this. Okay. Uh, the very fact that it creates a conditional use opportunity allows you an opportunity to review the specifics of this site. 
Um, Michael's correct, the UDC code is separate from this zoning issue that we're trying to work through. So the language is such that the in-family suite, I'll read it because I know people won't be able to see it. An in-family suite, suite is an area within a dwelling unit that may contain separate kitchen, dining, bathroom, laundry, living, sleeping, and recreation areas, including exterior porches, patios, and decks. In addition to the required internal physical connection, separate outdoor access or separate access to the garage may pr be provided. However, external stairs serving as the primary access to the in-family suite, suite are prohibited. So it's not necessarily an external stair that's being provided. You're providing an interior okay. stair well. Okay. Um, it's not an exposed stair condition. And the exterior emergency exit just goes to that second floor balcony. All right, that, that helps. Did you have any other follow-up <coughs> questions? Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Um, Thank you. Commissioner Seltzer. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure how we got through the parking <clears throat> issue um, so easily. I, I'm not, um, not as clear as I should be on this plan. Um, my experience is from rental units that the <coughs> garage is almost always filled up with belongings and then the cars are parked outside but you, you seem to refer to 60 feet of, of a, an area that they could park in that are yeah. on private property? If you can see the, the drawing, the, the, the garage is the very north right there. There's a two-car mm -hmm. garage, and then the driveway leading up to it, and then there's a spot to the right, that little triangular, that fits at least two cars. But the, the straight space um, that you're talking about without the two cars, yep. that that is the access to and from the garage correctly Correct. so nobody could park there why is that because they'd be in the way of the people trying to get in and out of the garage well then somebody would could move what so have you ever never parked behind somebody else in your driveway yes oh, and it the requires a little fire drill to get well that's out and it'll go they could work it out what, I don't understand what the problem is well and that might not even happen well, that, that's as easier. of right now, that's not even going to happen. Well, I, I understand his point, though, because it's easier to accommodate that if you have a single unit occupancy of a family, because then I can tell my brother to get out of my way. But if you've got two separate units, two rentals, they don't necessarily even like each other, um, to, to have to always coordinate people parking you in, that's not necessarily as easy to facilitate if this was a single unit. As of right now, there's two people, with, there's two units, and there's two cars. So they both park in the garage. Nobody's even using that other parking area. I understand, but we're setting a policy so we can't look at who the current tenant is. And so we have to anticipate the fact that the tenancy could turn over, that these, they aren't locked into a 10-year lease, I'm assuming, that they're probably one-year leases. One person's actually going to stay there. They're, they got an eight-year-old. But to, how long is the lease term? One year. Okay. And so she we, wants to stay for at least We, we can't 10 make years. city policy decisions based on who's living there now because the occupancy of those units can change. I mean, they may stay there, but we can't make policy decisions mm -hmm. based on the fact that they could turn over it when the next lease turns up. Okay, I, for example, I've got another property right over here, and I've got two people that park in the driveway. There's parked behind each other. What? What's the problem? Anybody else have any questions or comments? So I. Go ahead. Uh, well, I just say I, I can't quite agree with what you're saying, and I don't say that you're wrong. I just um, I think we should. You I think you mentioned the option of tabling the data. Um, I think that's what we should do. This, this sounds to me like a very complicated situation, and I do rent and have many times rented and owned properties, and the idea of having different tenants agree on who's parking where and who's going to get out of the way. Um, seems difficult so I would ask for yeah I would recommend instead of tabling it you would if you're gonna go that route to postpone it and that's what they're suggesting in Robert's rules these days that gives you the flexibility to have a discussion on it if you make a motion to table it it's really difficult to have you can't have debate 
So if, if you're looking to give us direction and this gentleman direction of what you would like to see in order to consider it at the next meeting, for example, I would suggest that you would you would do a postponed motion if that's the direction you're going to go, <laughs> unless you're willing to take action tonight. Um, so that's basically what they're telling us at these uh, at these parliamentary uh, trainings that we've been going to. Um, so I'll just throw that out there for your consideration. Uh, and, President Majewski, did you have something? I was going to suggest the same thing that uh, Mr. Seltzer was going to suggest, to, post to postpone. I, I just took that term table data from what you were saying. I didn't mean that that's the technical way this should be handled. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure before they yeah. make the motion, because I, once you do and it's seconded, okay. you cannot have a discussion on a, I, on a table. I would go with the option you're speaking okay. of, and I think we need we need to look really carefully at this. I, I'm, agreeing, I'm agreeing with So it. that's a motion to postpone? Is that what I'm hearing? That's what you said was yeah. the appropriate way. Yes. And then what we can do is we can talk about what we would like to see if there's a second you want to go down that route. I'll second that. Okay. And I'd like to see a more detailed parking plan that accommodates cars without having to, um, so that there's easy flow without, without obstruction. I'd also like to see, somehow possible, I'm not real thrilled about a, uh, an emergency stairwell hanging off the front of a building that's uh, as significant as this and as visible as this is. I'm not real pleased about that idea. Um, as far as the uh, ingress, egress out of the third floor with a, a locked or unlocked door, um, I would suggest the door be removed, that there, not, there, no, there be no door. Now, there is no question then in the future about having having this as a third third unit. That's fine. Got no problem with that. Okay. So what if I was to just make that parking area bigger? Well, that's do that? that'll, that'll be something that we will have to look at in yeah. detail. Why are you making this so difficult? Why? What's? I don't understand what the, what's the problem. Well, we I like. There's no. We need to actually see the plan. So certainly, you could come here with a larger parking area, but it's something that we would need to see laid out, and we're not going to design it right now on the screen. Are you, are you telling me it's illegal to park on the street? Um, there's no parking for the two blocks adjacent to this property. So sure, there is. Uh, the way I understand it is, it's signed. It's parking, it's a no on parking the street. Zone. It's this particular area because of the steep approach to Main Street. It's I park I, where I'm at the property all the time, and I park in the street all the time. <laughs> so is it signed as no parking along that block in front of the, or not? There's a portion of this area that is posted no parking okay. due to the proximity of the corner and the, and the traffic signal. It's okay. not for the entire block depth, but okay. there is some, some no parking area. All right. Okay, so... So I heard you want a plan for the parking. Is that what you're yes. looking for? And then the emergency exit, and then the locking door. Um, are you concerned about anything regarding the deed, having something on there? I would think that there would have to be something for the deed also, so that we can ensure that this does not become a third unit rental. So it would be put on a deed restriction. I'm not sure how that process would work. <coughs> Attorney Dragney is here. I don't know. You do you have any thoughts about how that would go? Well, just make, let me make sure I understand the thinking um, <clears throat> behind the suggestion. So with the, uh, what do we call this, an in-home family suite? Sounds correct, in-family yeah. suite. In-family suite. So the idea is that the person who lives in the suite has to be related, has to be a family member of the person of, shall we say, the, the, the rest of the unit, right? And that's a zoning requirement. So the idea behind a deed restriction, I think, would be to just make sure that someone who buys the property sees that, has notice of that when they buy the property so they don't. And I actually saw this recently in another community where someone bought a property that had one of these, <coughs> didn't understand that it was restricted to in family only, rented it to someone else, and then found themselves out of compliance with the zoning code. So. Um, it would be possible to attach a condition of approval requiring that. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily have to be a deed restriction. It could be simply a notice that would be required, just putting people on notice that this unit is restricted to occupancy by um, someone who's a, 
we'll have to look at the exact language of the ordinance, but a family member of the uh, of people in the in the principal unit, shall we say? So that could be done, as and that could be attached as a condition. So would you have a recommendation one way or another if we chose to go down that road, or would we need to do some more research on that? In terms of whether to require a notice? A notice versus a deed restriction. Oh, I would call it a notice. It's not really a restriction. Uh, it's just giving notice of what the zoning code says. And I don't see a reason to, uh, so a restriction would be potentially something that would w could become inconsistent with our zoning if the zoning changes. So I would just say, it would be a notice that, at least as of the such and such a date, this unit is uh, subject to a particular zoning requirement that restricts it to family occupancy. It already is. That's it's written right in the law. I mean, and this gentleman here is talking about taking the door off. Well, it's just right in the law saying you can have a door, but it just needs to be unlocked. You're trying to. He's trying to change the law. <laughs> I mean, well, no, my, my point like, is, to, in order to make sure that. We're not changing the law. The, the intent here is not to change the law. It's just to say if there were ever a sale, whoever would buy it would be able to easily see on the title report. I'm not selling it. There's a notice. I'm not selling the property. Not today you're not, but you know, you're going to own it forever? Probably until I die, yeah. Well, then somebody might buy it then. Then my daughters yeah. will take it over. Yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, Commissioner um, Barman. Um, I know as, as we're looking at this, when I was reading the material in the packet, part of it is the ability of the city staff to actually monitor and be able to, I'll use the word police, but to be able to make sure that this is in compliance. Because there's no notice when, the, you don't have to provide a notice to the city when you rent it or lease it to somebody else. And so even though there is a, a note in the, in the ownership of the property or the type or the um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the city's going to know that everything has changed hands and that something else might be going on. So I, isn't part of the issue here just in order just to be able to satisfy compliance from a staffing perspective at the city level? Are you talking about with respect to the recording of something? Or just, you know, even if it's not a, an issue of a sale of the property, it's just that, that one tenant leaves, a new tenant comes in, and now you have this in-family suite and they don't necessarily see the note because they're just a new tenant. And a new tenant brings someone else into that suite who's not necessarily a family member. So how is the city going to know that now they're out of compliance with the zoning code? I mean, it's just... So I would say recording the kind of thing we've talked about will not solve that problem. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's and, what I'm and, saying. And, I, and there is no easy solution to that problem. It, it usually gets discovered accidentally. Yes. And, and so that's why I think within the, the way the ordinance is set up now, there are some design issues that I think help mitigate that in the sense. The unlocked door. And then you don't have people, typically someone's not necessarily going to want to rent a space that they cannot lock their door unless they're family. So, I mean, I think there's some design um, checks and balances that are written into the code that help to set this up. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to see. And that's why we want... That's why we can't just solve this easily and quickly as, as fast as you want to right here, is that we actually need to see that the design is laid out properly. And I'm rather than just taking the door off, because I think that creates a safety issue for that person in that, that upper apartment or upper <clears throat> attic space, living space, if I can walk in that common area front door, which is there a key to that that is only available to the people who live in the units, or is the key spaces after you're in the stairwell and going into the units? There's a front door lock okay, so there's a that door two people have access to. Okay. The first floor unit and the second floor unit. Okay. And now the third unit through the second floor. Correct. Okay. But so there's a lock on the outside door. Correct. But then once I'm in the stairwell, then there's a lock on unit one and there's a lock on unit two. Correct. Okay. But what I'm saying is, is I don't know necessarily that just taking the door off or even having an unlocked door at the top of the third, uh, at the top of the attic stairs is necessarily the safest solution. Because now the first floor unit can now have access to that same. Agreed, but I'm just going by what your language, yeah. the so law I'm states. Just from a designer's perspective, and again, I haven't been inside the building, so I don't know how the stairwell lays out. But if you could picture on the stairwell the door, rather than having the door to the second unit be off the stair, and then having an open stair all the way to the third floor, is to reconfigure that door so that I can access the second floor or the third floor without getting through that second unit locked door. 
You know what I'm saying? No, I don't. But then there's a clear path between the second unit to the third unit on the rest of the stairwell. And again, I'd have to draw it out. And that's why we can't just make a decision without these things in plan document provided well, in advance. I guess what I'm going to suggest then is if you can get together with our planning director and his team and work through these items and then we can bring it back at the next meeting. Um, I think that would probably be the most efficient way. We're not going to solve it here tonight anyway. Yeah, and that's fine. I, of, I'm just going by right what I got. And the idea to follow it. every every single thing in it. The idea to postpone it is we don't want to just vote it down. We want to give you an opportunity to make sure we have something that we can approve. So I think that was the really the the intent of the motion. And I sure. think that would be the best way to do it would be for you to meet with the planning department and get these get through these issues, bring back some options. Okay. I, I don't want to take every time, but but um, I've gone through every single thing that is required, and so if it's not approved, you're just changing what's documented in the language. No, because I've gone there through are, there every are, single step. I mean, I'll, I'll disagree in the sense that there there is not enough detail here for us to know that you've actually complied with what's been written in the codes. And honestly, based on what's been provided, I would vote no. And so then you'd actually be out of the ability to do this. So we're actually giving you an opportunity to come back with more detail, more clarification. Otherwise, I, for one, would vote no tonight. Well, I'm just saying if you vote no, then you're then you're going against what actually, the language of the... Well, the way I see it is I'm not, because I'm evaluating... Did you read it? I did. I read it in What's, detail, which is why I had all the questions that I had. So in based on the the wording of the ordinance, based on what's been provided, I would vote no. Um, but I don't have for to... For what because, reason? Because I don't think we have the details to show that we've, that we've actually some fulfilled. Of the, some the of plan. the issues that were brought up are not detailed in the plan. So I would ask you to have the meeting, bring back a plan so we can vote on what it. Want, what do you want me to bring back? I've been back three times already. Bring a plan that shows you're compliant the second exit out of the, out of the okay. third floor. I mean, that's, that's, that's not in the packet. Gonna, I'm going to do that with Steve. I mean, that's, you said everything's in the packet. That's not in the packet. That's you're trying I to verbally to design it here. So that's the piece well. that... I think can <coughs> support Mr. Unless Barman. anybody else has anything else they want to add or say to this, I, I think, think the three we things that were included in it. the postponement. Okay. What about addressing, the, the addressing parking? The what park. do you want me to do about the parking? What do I need to do? What do I need to do about the parking? What I understood them to say is draw out how each car could park in that facility and how many functions. cars? How many cars do I need to have parked? It sounds like you could accommodate more than. Okay, well, what, what's, the, what's the law? What, what's what's it going to take for me to do this? You're not you're not I'm, giving me any. I'm welcome to discuss this on yeah. staff time. I, I think you'd be better off. It'll be more productive if you just meet. Okay, and work can you let me know so I can? Yeah. Otherwise, I have no idea. Yeah. There isn't a hard and fast answer to that question. Okay. I don't think in the code. So that'll be a judgment that you'll decide what you want to show, and then the plan commission will decide if they are satisfied that that's adequate, and. Uh, so there isn't helpful. because there's nothing in the code that says the do I need room for six cars, five. eight cars. What do I need room for? I, I, have, I have no idea what you're. I think trying during to the at. course of your discussion, I think that you guys will be able to figure that out between you. Bring back some recommendations or some options. This group can review them, and hopefully, we can come to a conclusion. Uh, that's what I would suggest. Um, so, I, unless anybody has anything else, I'd say we probably should take a vote on the motion. And the motion was to postpone until we have the information. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None I opposed. I abstain from this vote, Carries. Jim, because I only came in half of the discussion. Okay, one abstention. So that'll take us to item number seven, and that's a request by Marsha Berrigan to amend the zoning ordinance to allow fencing to be placed in the easements. And uh, we can introduce this one uh, before. We have several people signed up for the public hearing for this one. So, um, Director Shield, did you have something you want to start with here? Yeah, the commissioners and council members have, have heard us talk about fence issues over the years. Um, this request is before you uh, as a result of a, a constituent that would like to see the code change to have easements uh, at least evaluated to allow fences on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's the draft language that's in your packet now. Um, cur currently, there is a prohibi prohibition for fences within easements for uh, within the city. So that's that's the request before us. I think historically, you would find that there was similar language to this many many years ago. 
Um, and we also can included some materials from other communities for your consideration. Anybody have any questions before we go into the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close our regular meeting and reopen for the public hearing. And we have three people signed up so far. And the first one is uh, Michael Berrigan. We're going to go together. Okay, come on up. Who are you with? I'm Marsha Berrigan. I'm the one who proposed this. Oh, okay. Yeah, come on up to the microphone. Thanks for being here. Hi, thanks, thanks for having us. Hopefully this one is less controversial. We'll see. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so we just, uh, we moved to a new house about a year ago. We live on next to two, two fields, two agriculture fields on a busy street. We have four kids. We have one-year-old twins. We have a three-year-old. We have an 11-year-old. But one of them has autism. It's hard to keep them safe in our yard. We have tractors that come. Our lot, our house is 35 feet from from where the tractors come. It's very, very close. It, if one of kid runs one direction, I don't know which one to chase. It's not safe. They're very fast too. They're very, very fast. Good. And Can everybody hear them? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we're asking, we have util, we have easements on our property, which we learned when we tried to install a fence this year. On the back lot line, we have a 12-foot easement. On the west lot line, we have a 30-foot easement. So if we were to try to build a fence within those, without going into those easements, there really wouldn't be any yard left. So what we are asking is that because there, there's these utility easements that are not being used, if there could be some consideration that on a case-by-case -case basis or a situation similar to ours or any other cases, that it be considered by the affected utility to allow a fence within that easement. And, and, oh, and it is in harmony with the comprehensive plan, which we read, <laughs> because um, we saw that one of the goals is to create attractive and safe neighborhoods for, for the community. Okay, thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I don't have anything unless there are any questions for us. Okay. Are there any questions from the commissioners or anything you want to add? <coughs> Otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker. And you can hang around and, and we'll uh, eventually be taking action on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, the you. next person that would be signed up would be Greg Gilbert. Oh, okay. He registered in support of the matter. Thank you. And then uh, also uh, Karen Griffin, uh, she registered in support of the above matter as well. So uh, would anyone else uh, wish to come up and speak on this topic? If none, we'll close the public hearing and we'll reopen for our business. And do you have anything else you want to cover? I can just report that the utilities director indicated if this is the direction that of the ordinance change, they would have to establish criteria um, to determine whether it's appropriate for release of or use of their easement in situations um, w where where they might be accommodated. And Attorney Dragney, do you have anything you'd yeah, like to add? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this issue, but <clears throat> what 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 I think needs to be considered here is that this is talking about a zoning code standard, but I don't think anyone should assume that just because the ordinance has changed to say that from a zoning standpoint you know the it's not an issue that that means it's not an issue under the terms of the easement and um, so the the interesting quest one of the questions in my mind is and um, whether it makes sense to put the city in the middle of dealing with these issues under the zoning code trying to evaluate whether or not for example from a zoning standpoint somebody has the necessary approvals from utilities and so on these easements can be um, can be tricky uh, so for example if you've got a plat that says utility easement on it um, that utility easement is uh, the one of the questions you run into is who are the beneficiaries of that utility easement? There could be more than one utility. Yeah, and there could be uh, cable television providers. Uh, they are calling themselves utilities now. Yeah, I mean, and and so <coughs> I guess my point is, if this is approved, uh, I might change the language, tweak the language a little bit. 
I'm not even sure why we need this in the zoning code, frankly. I mean, if you're not, if you're allowed to do it under the consistent with an easement, then fine. If you're not, you're not. But that's really determined based on the easement. And so I'm concerned about kind of creating this zoning process where someone would come here and I guess I'm not even sure who would decide at a staff level whether now you have all of the what written exceptions you need by all of the affected utilities it's putting it's putting us in a position where somebody's going to have to decide do you now have that in hand and I'm not sure how we're going to do that is that only for the utilities that are currently affected or could it be for future utilities um, good question um, I don't think we know the answer to that I mean so this comes up with um, when you want to get a utility easement released um, from a title standpoint if I if, if I need that release then I have to get enough signatures and approvals from enough utilities to satisfy a title company to say I'll I'll agree to issue a title commitment that shows that there is no longer a utility easement there but that's these are all issues of you know what the easement law and it's not really a zoning issue so for example let's say we didn't even have that fencing standard and that just wasn't in the code just delete the whole thing the whole requirement the whole prohibition on putting a fence in a in an easement if you just took that out of your zoning code the issue would still be there in terms of do you, do you have a right to put that fence there or not and so you might put that fence there and then a utility might show up and say get your fence out of my easement so that's that's the there's really two separate things going on so I guess the the question that I'm wondering is do we even need that in the zoning code or should this just be addressed through the easement I, and I'm not I'm not sure how to answer that you know, doesn't sound like it's anything we're going to solve right now but um, go ahead Commissioner Mar Barman that, that's exactly the direction I was leaning in part because of the other community research that you've done where it says for example Sun Prairie fences are allowed in utility easements and um, Verona Pittsburgh uh, Economowoc fences are allowed so uh, maybe for the per for the help of the Commission could you guys remind us how because I know we've had some changes recently on how fences are dealt with in general to take a little of the the burden off of staff on all the approval process and the monitoring and everything else I mean hasn't that whole fencing process been simplified in the in the code or not yet no oh, it hasn't <laughs> Okay. No, no fences that create a, a great challenge for us. Um, I'll just talk about positioning of them properly on the site. Yeah. Uh, you know, aside from easements, having them positioned properly on the sites creates a real challenge for property owners because they have to know exactly where their property stakes are. If they're not identified, they have to have a surveyor locate them. Um, the, the parallel to what Attorney Dregney said is some some neighborhoods have restrictive covenants on fencing. Period. The zoning code is silent on those covenants, so there may still be prohibitions on fencing that we don't regulate or unique that, are, to the property. that are unique to the property, somewhat similar to what he's referring to, rights of easement holders okay. um, to that infrastructure. So the way I understand it, the, the whole fencing section could probably Im be improved <laughs> if, we're start <laughs> if we're starting to make recommendations. But I, I would lean toward the fact that this is not rather than just making a change uh, by adding the clause at the end of that statement I would lean more toward just taking 3-1 out uh, of the books because again it, if you don't deal with it on a you know for covenants of, of you know um, other neighborhood associations and those kinds of things I don't see why you would need to deal with it separately as part as these easements go under that scenario um the city wouldn't be reviewing any applications for fencing. It would be left up to the private property owner to have compliance with whatever easements might be in place there. Um, we could still have some standards related to heights and other things, but um, not related to the easement aspect of it. But there's, the way I understand it, though, there's still other yes. um, fencing standards that apply to all properties True. in terms of setbacks and other right. so I mean they'll still have to abide by the setback requirements right it's just that you as staff won't be required to check on the easement issue that that's on the properties the property owners I guess my question is from the does the planning department feel that there's a value to looking at 
easements as part of a fence application from the city's point of view, or is that better left to the utilities to deal with? Uh, um, the, the utilities doesn't really want to deal with an every request type situation. I can't dismiss that concern. We alert property owners to easements that are in place. Um, this prohibition, if you will, protects that easement from that po possibility of somebody putting them in an easement that they might not have obtained rights from all the applicable easement holders. And I think what we've heard in the past is where maybe they hire somebody to put the fence up in the fence company, there's an assumption that they're going to reach out to us. It's really on the homeowner. It's their responsibility to make sure that somebody's in contact with us to make sure their fence goes up in the right location according to where it's staked out in the plans they've submitted. And we've had situations in the past where fence companies have put up a fence really in the wrong spot and we've asked them to move it or remove it, which also creates a very uncomfortable situation and expense for everybody. So we certainly would want to avoid that. So on, on this particular one, you know, it's it's difficult because if, if we're going to look at it on a one by one, are we going to try to come up with something that really covers us for the long run? We're not going to be able to do the long run tonight. So I'm trying to figure out process wise what we should do. We don't like to leave people hanging on a decision, but we also want to do it correctly. Well, I'll say uh, the other thing, concern I have from a legal standpoint is I'm concerned about giving the authority to approve an exception to a zoning requirement to a list of unknown utilities that that may have an interest in these easements again this isn't about them having a right to enforce their own easement this is now about giving a right to utilities to decide whether under our zoning code you're going to be allowed to put a fence in an easement and i don't th I, I think there's a real legal question whether we could do that. Um, I don't know that we could turn over to private utility companies or Stoughton Utilities the right to decide whether to allow fences in easements for purposes of our zoning code. Looks like it's going to be one of these nights. Um, go ahead. So, Rodney. You, you said that when they come in with a, a fence application, mm -hmm. that you inform them that there are easements on their property that may not allow this? Uh, right now, our code says you can't put a fence in an easement. So, but, so but you, you, you said something about you, you, you tell property owners when there, there are easements. Certainly. Um, we, we inspect the plat materials. Uh, if there's something on the plat, we provide them that easement information because um, we have to evaluate whether that fence is being proposed in an easement or not. So we have to go through that in evaluation. Um, there may be other recorded easements that we're not aware of, but the ones that are platted, we're certainly making them aware of, and we're enforcing those platted easements from preventing those fences in those locations. All right. I just want to clear that up. Thank you. Any thoughts or ideas? I mean, if we're going to change the zoning, this is really a first step in the process. So there would have to be a recommendation. It would go to council. They would have two whacks at it before they would approve it. Um, I would prefer not to send something there unless you guys are comfortable with it. And I kind of look at the council members that are here, too to see what your thoughts are. But go ahead, Commissioner Barman. You know how I'm a wordsmith, I mean, and I can't do this on the fly, but to me it would make more sense within this code, um, if we're not rewriting the whole fencing standards and, and the whole codes, is to just say, I, mean, I think it makes sense to address easements in the sense that <coughs> you could say fences um, within an easement need to abide by all the other standards in terms of setback and other requirements, and they also are going to need to check with their respective utilities. I mean, it's just a kind of a note that the, to the property who's reading through the ordinance to know what they can and cannot do as it relates to fences, that this would trigger them a rewording of this rather than saying they're just dis disallowed, is to say that any fence within an easement would have to abide by all the other standards in terms of setback and placement, but 
they're also going to have the issue of having to uh, fulfill whatever um, affected whatever is affected by the easement, just like you have other covenants. My concern was uh, would be I, I wouldn't want to put the zoning staff then in the position where when they've got an application to put a fence in, they're going to have to determine are are they allowed to put this fence here in a way that you know does the easement allow for that? Right. And well, I, I think the wording would have to be such that they know that they deal with the city with respect to setbacks and placement, and it's it's at and they're required to deal with the, that and just say the, the city's not going to get involved whether it, it fulfills the easement requirements or not. It's just drawing attention to the fact that as a property you need to be aware of the fact that the easements have special considerations. And, and, and my concern is is they could put the fence in, and then there could be a, a cell company or another um, telecommunications that come in and declare that there are utilities now you've got a fence and an easement that I want to use but that could, that could happen under this case either in this particular wording because it says unless a written exception has been made by an affected utility and as you said we might not know all the affected utilities at this point in time so down the road you may have gotten approval from th two or three the ones that were key and some other utility may come up and say that I have the right to this utility corridor as right, well. Right, and then and they have to pull their fence out. I know. So then you're basically saying that you just now disallow all of them. That's Campbell. And, and, I, and I don't think that that necessarily is the way that they want this to go, is for us to just not have any clause and disallow everything. So, well, so the way, my inclination, I'm not sure this is, you know, uh, what everyone would want to do, but I would say take that out. We don't deal with it under our zoning code, uh, and it's really, I mean, the easements are there, and and you're either allowed to have a fence under the easement, or you're not allowed, or, and this is not going to be unusual, it's not going to be so clear in some cases um, whether you're allowed to have a fence there. But um, rather than attempt to, unless there's a real value to regulating this through the zoning code, I wouldn't try and regulate it through the zoning code, but I'd say this, if we are going to regulate it through the zoning code, then we have to follow the zoning framework, which is we don't turn, you know, special <coughs> exception questions over to private utility companies when it deal when it, with our zoning code. Right. Those are dealt with by the city. We'd have to decide what standards will we apply to decide whether we're going to allow you to put a fence, at least from a zoning standpoint, in an easement. So my preference would say let's not try and do this through zoning. I would say use the easements. It's a, you know, and then if you're a property owner, you know, the folks we heard from tonight, no change to this isn't going to change the easements. The easements are still there. Right. And so what they have to determine is, do we have a right to put a fence there given the easements that encumber our property? Yes. And changing this language is not going to change that. They'll still have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're at a point where we either have to move forward on this version or something like it or decide to remove it or ask us to come back with some additional recommendations based on, you know, maybe doing some more homework or something like that. And we'll do whatever you guys want us to do. So give us some direction here. Go ahead. Could we remove, remove this statement, have uh, something put into the uh, application for a fence for fencing requests that the homeowner supply a written permission from easement holders that that they've been cleared to put something in that easement would that satisfy if we wanted to do that we would need something in the code that required that so if we took but this out we wouldn't, wouldn't be in the zoning code we could put it you can't require it in the application. Re require it in the application, but not... Yeah, I mean, I guess if we're going to impose a, a regulatory obligation on someone to deliver that, we, we could do that. I'd want to... I'm not sure that makes sense. Instead, what I would do is say, I might just put something on the application that says, you know, beware. <laughs> you know, we're, we're saying this is okay under our code, but you may be subject to... There may be easements that affect your property, and you should check into that because... You know, we don't control that. That's some other party out there. Now, there may be cases where the where the city or Stoughton Utilities is one of the parties that has an interest in those easements, and somebody might come to the city and say, 
I'd like to, you know, modify the terms of the easement that applies to my property to make it clear that I can do this. I think that's why they're here tonight. Yeah, but, but this isn't the way. To, this that. isn't the way to do it. Yeah. Not through the zoning code. Well, this language would still have to be altered. We'd still have to deal with in this. addition to this. Yes. Because they couldn't, right. if the yeah. language is left as is. Yeah. Right now, as a matter of zoning, you can't do it. Correct. But if you take this out, you still have the easements to deal with. And easements are terribly tricky because on these plats, a lot of times it just says utility easement. Right. It's not really clear what that means. So we have some developers in the room that can vouch for that. So go ahead. All right. So, so I'm real close to making a motion to, to strike. 3i from the fencing standards, but I just want to check with staff because I because we're not seeing the whole rest of that section. I mean, and so I can't really evaluate if removing that is going to have any impact on what comes before or after. The um, rest of the section 78, 718. The rest of section three even within 78, 718. So, I guess from staff's perspective, if that was gone, I mean, do you guys do any red flags go off in your mind that that's going to interrupt some other important connection to other parts of the, the I code. So. I don't think so. Because I hate striking paragraphs without seeing what comes before or after. Was that? 78 what? 78 one th here. 78 13 was it? 78 718. Yep, and it's 3i within 7, 78 718. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll pull it up on the screen in just a moment. I don't see a problem personally. I'm okay. looking at it. it. It seems like a paragraph that just is checking off bullets of things that we got to make sure we address. So I wouldn't think it would be a problem striking it, but I just wanted to do a quick double check. And again, within, I don't know if I'm doing this correctly based on what's already on the table in terms of this resolution, but I would move to rather than um, change the wording of 78-7183I to just strike 3I from 78-718. Okay, is there a second? A second. And then any discussion or? And it, yeah, so one quick discussion. I do like the idea of having the warning or heads up on the application that it's, it's at, that the owners need to, if they have an easement on their property, that they need to take care of all that stuff and have it be just on the application as a lookout. But I don't know if that's part of this motion or not. I think administratively they would do that. Yeah. Um, did you have anything else you want to add? Okay, so with the motion in the second, we'd be removing this. It would still have to go to city council for first and second reading. So we're looking at basically a month. And then um, between now and then, if, if they wanted to pursue it, they could start contacting the affected utilities companies. Is that what I'm hearing? So if the city council approves it, they would be good to go. Well, then at least they don't have to worry about zoning. I mean, they could just put a fence up and hope that uh, no utility shows up and says, get your fence out of my easement area. Okay. Did you have a question? We got contacted, though, with the thing. When we, oh, we put the fence and we're always referenced back to the zoning and the ordinance and they That's the barrier. The yeah, you feel like you're chasing your tail. Yeah. And we, we're sorry about that. So hopefully this will help clarify that for you and people going forward. So. We appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Um, did anybody else have any questions or comments? Go ahead. Uh, is it possible we could also <clears throat> uh, sign knowledgeable people on this subject to maybe contact a few communities right around us that have, that have had some ideas about this and had it work out well before we start trying to reinvent something that um, is Think bound it, to be very complicated. I think you'll see in your packet, at least the communities we contacted relative to zoning, that's how they've either handled it or not. 
Many of them don't cover it in zoning regulations. Okay. So these these communities have already stricken it, just like <coughs> we were talking about. Though. Okay. Has that been your right. experience as well, Attorney this is, the first, this is the first time I've seen this issue come up personally. Um, so I've not seen. I mean, it could be in other codes and communities I work in, but this is the first time I've seen it. So, okay. I, to me, it makes sense to separate it from zoning. It seems like a sub, somewhat of a different issue than a zoning issue to me. Okay. Because I'm sure the city council will have these same questions, so we'll have to do some additional research between now and then. Anyway, to your point, did you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, please. Uh, just to mention, is there any way we can deal with the issue they're concerned about on a preliminary basis, or do we have to have them? I mean, or is it urgent for them to have this? Not urgent, but. You know, how much inconvenience is this going to be if we go through this whole process of redoing this? It seems like what they're concerned with may not be addressed in any timely manner. Is there something we can do in that regard? Well, I would say if things went smoothly, it would be on the City Council for um, first reading on the 25th. And then it would be, typically we have two readings, so it would be on uh, July 9th is when the council could consider approving unless they felt a desire to waive the rules on the 25th. I don't know if they'll have enough information to do that, and I would lean on those members that are here to decide whether or not um, the council did. But that would be, you know, the earliest would be two weeks from tomorrow. More than likely it will be four weeks from tomorrow. That works for you guys? Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Did you get the motion? You got the verbiage? Oh, yep. Yep. Okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. <clears throat> right. Next item, number eight. This one should sound easy, but the way the night's going, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> request by Sunny Swanstu for site plan approval to place a gazebo at the American Legion at 803 North Page Street. Um, Director Shield. Staff review letter uh, is included in your packet related to this one. Um, of notable uh, interest is the requirement for it to be at least 20 feet away from other buildings, so that would be necessary as part of their site placement. Okay. Any questions or comments or go ahead. So I was trying to figure out where this would be placed. I mean, is, is it cited on this map? Am I missing something? We're not talking about where it says building and then 30. That's not where it's cited, is it? That's a different building on the property? We over That's correct. Okay, uh, so it's closer to the highlighted in yellow, we believe, but so it's uh, somewhere in this area, but, but we it don't has know. To be at least 20 feet away from the proper the building. Okay. I, I thought I was missing something. So we don't know exactly where yet. And my other question is, when I first look at this building, I mean, it's nice, but it, to me it doesn't read to me as portable. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out how you're going to move this. And I don't um, know if there's anybody they, here from the Legion. They plan to put it on wheels. On wheels? So we've been told. So it can be wheeled into a garage or something? For the season. Yeah, that's there what are they indicated. sheds there. They indicated really? it would oh, probably okay. end up in building 30. <laughs> okay. In, in all honesty, to me, if it doesn't get moved, I think it's still an improvement to the front of that building, to the looks of the front of that building. So it won't go on the front. It's the back. Yeah, it will actually be to the rear. This is to the rear? Yeah, okay. So Page Street is on the left. So we'll have a good looking rear. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably somewhere near the horseshoe pits, which aren't on the map either, the way I understand. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, gonna be between there. the building You've and the horseshoe pits. I've not been oh, there. Oh, I see now. Oh, Page. Over the horseshoe yeah, yeah. Pits You're over. right. I see now. <laughs> I didn't look at that Page Street there. Okay. Any questions or com any additional comments? Otherwise, I would be um, looking for looking for a motion. Well, I guess I do have one question. Go ahead. Is there a, a requ is there a requirement that this be portable, or is that just their choice to their make choice. it portable? It's not a requirement. Okay. Well, I'll make a motion to approve it as submitted. 
Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second by Seltzer. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. None opposed. That carries. Uh, number nine, request by Chuck and Jean McMillan for downtown design overlay zoning district renovation approval to repair, replace front windows <coughs> at 171 West Main Street. So I'm guessing we're going to test our new ordinance. Yes. Um, would you like to start? Oh, you're here. here. Good evening. Thanks for waiting. I'm not Mr. McMillan, but I'm here because they live in Tennessee. Okay. And they can't attend, and their daughter's about to have a child, so she couldn't attend. She lives in St. Kai's Grove. So the reason they bought that is to be up closer to them. It's their only child and their only granddaughter coming, or grandson. So, so my far. name is Mark McCauley. I'm with Bachman Construction, and I'm helping them with the building, trying to make it, trying to make some improvements on it, which we are currently doing, if you haven't noticed. Uh, we got a permit for maintenance. Probably have some pictures in there. I could show you all kinds of befores and afters. I probably should have brought some, but we've been working on the back side and the side of the building because uh, there's really bad repair on the brick. So that's all voluntary in their part. And uh, so they've been doing a nice job on that. So if you want to see some befores and afters, I'd be happy to show them to you. But uh, they also uh, put together a letter. I don't know if they got a chance to send that to you. Yeah, it's in the packet, I believe. Yeah, it's Pretty much just spelling out that they want to improve the property. So we're down to a review requirement on three windows. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Barman? Yeah, it might not surprise you that I have questions. <laughs> well, usually you do, especially on downtown buildings. Yeah. No, that's great. I think um, you so guys have got a great just thing to, going. Mostly just clarification questions to start with. Sure. So I know that they had a request in their drawing here of removal of this divider. Yeah. Um, but it's still shown here on the detail of the window. So I'm, yeah. I, I guess for, just for clarifications, are we going with the divider? I, I'm assuming that this window on the right is actually this window on yeah, the Yeah, I had Design Window Center draw up a proposal. Okay. And so he did a one for one. That's what that drawing is All right. representing. So this is the proposal, but they're requesting that. Was that was prior to, yeah. Okay. Uh, but she's kind of an artist. And without the divider on they, the, on the Yeah, floor. they like things to look the same. And, you know, frankly, the divider might have been on those in 1890. I don't know. Yeah. Well, but, uh, looking at the age of the window, it out the or pictures, whatever. Yeah. I'm guessing it, that one was divided, similar to the way they had divisions mm -hmm. on the transoms here. I, I have no idea. Um, the other is just on the size, because it was a little unclear to me in the write-up whether or not these new windows that we see detailed architecturally here, if they're going all the way out to the masonry, or it, it was in some of the descriptions, it sounds like these windows, the new ones, are actually fitting inside to That's some That's a great extent. question. They are technically inserts. So okay. what happens in a lot of window replacement is the outside uh, Lack of a frame, I guess, would be, would be lack of a better word, would probably be will stay. So maybe I can. So you'll have the, his, the so you'll have the historic framing of the window. Yeah. So this will still be here. That stays. And then you pop out the two double hungs. In essence, that pops out. This 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 piece normally comes out, and then the window goes in. In this case, they had like a lot of little windows. They had, you know, the, had, had the weight. So the actual, yeah, I've taken them apart. So, yeah, the, really cold. <laughs> so the size of the glass opening now is actually going to decrease, though, because now we're inserting a new framed window. Yeah, inside the old frame. It window. would probably decrease about a half an inch. A half an inch is all. Yeah, that's, that's what I want a clarification. It's, it's on. very minimal. You no, know, probably it, not very visible to the naked eye on the I, first floor. I think it'd be. It'd be, um, these are pretty expensive marble windows, so okay, we could get narrower ones and make them vinyl or, you know, things like that. But if you're going to do wood, which is what they're doing, they want wood on the inside to keep it, period. Because the reason I ask well, is, if this is if this is setting in here, it shows a difference of almost <clears throat> like seven inches, because it goes from 49 inch dimension where the glass is out to 56 inches to the outside of the new frame. 
you see here, 49 inches here to the, to the new glass opening. Yep. And it's 56 out here, this, but that's got to set inside where the glass currently is. Oh, so it almost, enough. so yeah, it almost looks three like. Three and a half inches on each side. Because three and a half inches, losing three and a half inches on each side of the glass is quite a bit different than a half inch. Maybe I did my math, but you also have some there already, which would be the window plus that. That oh, I got you because you got the framing yeah, of the a double plus hung. This guide. So, okay. And I'm, maybe I did my math wrong, but I thought it would be. Okay, so you, I got you. So because of the wood of the frame of the double hung, that's right. sliding and up that's and down. Yet, right? Yes. So the actual glass will be smaller, likely. Okay. It's pretty hard to get a really narrow quality five foot wood window without right. having holes in each of Oh no, I understand. That's why, and then. The last, because we don't have, we've got the drawing. It's okay, I have one more question, Mayor? Sure, you're on a roll. All right. So <laughs> the other clarification, whenever I hear aluminum clad, yeah, I get it. my warning flags go up because a lot of times it's just the shiny aluminum that you end up seeing. And the way I understand it, this is going to be um, a some kind of... I put it in words there that we would try to keep the profile similar, you know, okay. so to be a man of my word company of our word. Yes. Uh, sort of getting on a ladder and actually measuring each measurement. Yes. Okay. You so found one that was approximate. You know, or you bent I that? It I got gotcha. you. Let me bend it. It will bend the uh, job. Okay. And I would buy the clad from the window company Marvin. Okay. Probably have the color in here. Yep. Right here. They, they, identical. So, all. Okay. And actually, what's there now? So, so the, the idea was to have a profile that would be rounded and have that type of to wood. cover the wood that remains. Yeah. And this is close. This is not perfect. I'm just doing it based on All right. what it looks like. But I wanted to give you a sample. Yeah, no, I so appreciate that. Dancing, you know, and I get it. And I've got pictures I can show you all kinds of buildings that don't look that great right now right. on Main Street. So, if you're going to set a standard, this is not a bad one. Uh, so you don't have those boxy, ugly things happening. Yep. You know, from a distance, it's going to be low maintenance gonna have some and look really to nice it. for a long time. So that's what they want to do. Okay. And is it? Get on a ladder and try to paint it like everybody else, but you know what happens. All now, is this powder? Is it a powder-coated surface, or what is? Oh, the, that's a good question. Um, when we get that color, because one of the big issues with probably aluminum, enamel paint, most okay. most companies come with enamel. All right, because I know one of the biggest things with a, a, a aluminum clad is mm -hmm. that it ends up being shiny and reflective, which when you oh. paint wood, it's yeah. not. That's a good question. And so, um, I, I guess, not that I would necessarily require it before approving, but I would put in a. a you can't request. set a standard for one side of the street versus the other. Yeah. This one won't get much fun. The other side will. But that's that's the finish. This is the finish? Yeah. And that's the reflect that's essentially what it would be. That's, carbon, that's the color. That okay. The All right. And we would buy a coil. This is what I want from them. This so is what I wanted to see. Let's pass this around because I think that's important for us to see those kind of those kind of details. Anybody want to see this? This would set a standard if you're looking for one, you know, because a lot of times all they do is bend it square, yeah. and you don't get the period profile that you would on most framing. So that's the idea. At least that's how we read the guides, guidelines. All right. So, what's that? No, I like that. It's, it's not going to be the kind of reflection that you get. Out of curiosity. Yeah. Did you get a cost to rehab the windows? Is there a cost? Did you did you did you look at the cost for rehabbing the, the original rehabbing windows? Rehabbing existing right windows? Yes. Yeah, well, that's one again. Yeah. No, but I've done a lot of that. Uh, I would say we could probably make them for less. So these are high quality Marvin windows. I know I'll show I, you the bit if you want to see it's a high it. quality Marvin window. Marvin window makes a great great product. That, that wasn't the question. The question I had was the window efficiency is not much difference between a brand new window and an old window if it's rehabbed correctly. And I was just wondering if you had, if it was explored at saving the original windows and having them rehabbed so that you wouldn't have the, the issues, the, the windows aren't leaky themselves once they're rehabbed. It's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's around, it's the leakage around the unit. And that can be addressed when you're 
when you're redoing rehabs. Well, I don't live there. I just heard what the tenant and what the I, owner I said. That. So they just said it was really cold. I don't. I don't um, live there either. But yeah. when you rehab a window correctly, you have the same efficiency if you have a decent storm window on it as as you do a new window. Just about. It's the difference between okay. the two is only about point zero zero. So storm windows. Percent. Storm windows are okay to add. No, I'm just I'm just talking in general. Well, no, I'm asking, just responding to what you said. Question. You said with a storm window, and I agree with right. you. So you're right. Uh, or you can router out the frame, which I've done before too, and you, you can put you can, in you sure. can put in glass, but it takes away quite a bit of the sash, and you won't get a full the same amount of insulation quality. Great question. Could it be done? Sure, anything could be done. Yeah. yeah. What what's often recommended is an interior storm rather than an exterior storm that allows you to put that up and within an historic preservation context I agree 100 percent I think in a lot of cases it's, it's better to go with rehab of the windows and um, it, these lasted 100 years and my guess is the Marvel one is not going to last 100 years um, but I guess for the new council members when we went through the rewrite of the code we had to stress the fact that this is not a historic preservation code I understand that I was yeah. part of that Good. yeah Based on what I read, um, you know, from staff, that they think this would be an appropriate um, replacement according to Chapter 78, which is code we're using down there. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that, or otherwise, um, we're looking for we're looking for approval if somebody would like to make a motion. Move to approve. Motion by Seltzer, is there a second? Second. Second by Robinson. Any more discussion on this one? Um, just, I, I put in that request that we, if it's any, if it's a lot more than that half an inch uh, of lost glass space, which I think the, your, your calculations are probably pretty close. Okay. Then I, I just kind of watch that. But I think with okay. the way the windows inspect, I just don't want the, one of the real important parts of the code yeah is to not be downsizing the glaze yeah, the, the actual glass. read that very carefully. That was size. Yeah. And so we're not filling we're, it in or anything like yeah. that. As long as we're within that tolerance, then. I'm meeting tomorrow morning because I'm leaving to go to Montana tomorrow afternoon with the Marvin rep. Okay. On, or not the Marvin rep, but the window design center guy. And I'll double check that. All right. If it's more than an inch, you need me to call Mike? Or? I, I would say if, if it's less than an inch, then we're good. If it starts going over an inch, I think oh. that's going to be visible from okay. yeah. from the street. Fair enough. I Thank like you. your half inch number better, though. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I'm pretty sure that 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 stop thing disappears, yeah. which is about three quarters. Okay. That plus the slash, I think we're s close. We're pretty to close. What I told you. All right. I could be wrong. But I don't think I. You am. could double check it. Okay. All right. Okay. That's fair enough. So we have a motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, when I was checking in, I saw that Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank and you. thanks for bringing in the samples, too. We appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. We're not trying to get away with something cheap. Uh, make sure you don't leave without them, though. Do what? We'll claim them if you leave without yeah. them. Well, go take a look at the building. You'll see the yeah, backside. We'll be down there. a lot better. Yeah. And we're going to fix that stone on the front, mm -hmm. too. Excellent. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. All right. So we have... Looks like we have one, two, three, four items uh, left over related from uh, Forward Development Group, and they're here. And the first item is a request to approve the final plat for Kettle Park West North Edition. And how would we like to begin? Um, well, certainly, uh, Attorney Dregney and I can can begin to walk through it. The developers are here and can talk to it as well. Um, Kettle Park West North. Plat North Edition is an area that we believe is still consistent with the original preliminary plat that was approved for Phase Two. This is a subset of that Phase Two preliminary plat approval. Um, and just to walk through what it encompasses, I'll just give you an overview of the layout. Jackson Street will terminate at a point approximately at this location um, at the end of this year. This plat includes the extension of Jackson Street to Oak Opening Drive. The plat includes Oak Opening Drive to a point to the, this location, not quite to County or State Highway N, and extends all the way north to the North Platte line. 
you'll recall that uh, Deer Point Road and Roby Road are approximately on the northern edge of this pa page. This plat also includes the extension of a new street to the west. Um, the overall plan as shown and being requested for tonight also will include rezoning of these lots to SR5. Um, it will accommodate this parkland dedication area as well as outlot. Um, I believe it's the outlot up in this corner here, the expansion of the stormwater management area. Lot, a lot too, correct? Two, yeah. Yeah. So that's just a quick synopsis of the layout of this plat that's being proposed. Um, subsequent to this item, there is a request, or we'll be considering the, the CSM, and the CSM is an area that just for clarity encompasses essentially the southern part of the stormwater management area and then the connection area to State Highway 138. Um, the rezoning would include, is being requested to include parcels within the CSM area as well. What am I, what am I missing in my overview? Those are the three items related to this preliminary plat area. Um, there's a CSM in con concert with that, rezoning and the final plat. The resolution that's included in your plat, we can walk through the items that um, we've identified for conditions of the plat approval that are included in the resolution. Um, and there's a whole lot of information there, so if you have any questions either now or as we go through this, don't be afraid to ask, but it's... <clears throat> A lot of information there. So Friday read every word twice. <laughs> it's some more than that. <laughs> um, so the recitals of the resolution just articulate what the, the, the documents are that we're referring to. On the second aspect of the resolution, we get into the, the resolution itself. And if you will, they're kind of conditions of, of approval. And I'll, I'll speak to each of them. Um, and we can talk about them. So the first one, um, the dedication of additional public right-of-way to extend Oak Opening Drive all the way to the northerly right-of-way of State Highway 138. So that piece that I showed you down next to State Highway 138, we, we believe should be uh, dedicated to make that commitment for that connection at a future time. Um, Outlot 2 is a public stormwater area and as part of this plat, we're recommending it not be accepted as part of the dedication. Uh, we think the public stormwater um, system will be more suitable for discussion as part of uh, the future phases to uh, articulate when that dedication would occur. Um, outlot four is, and maybe it'd be easier if I actually had this up on the screen and, and point to them, I'm sorry. You probably have the resolution in front of you. Let me get back to the graphic. So outlot four is really just a future stub street. Um, it's located where this future street would connect. So we're requiring this be dedicated as public right away as part of this plat. And then item four outlines a number of things that would have to be worked out as part of the development agreement. And many of them are consistent with um, the pulmonary plat approval related to public off-site off -site improvements on-site and off-site improvements related to Oak Opening Drive and what that would look like. Um, yeah, and, and the intersection of 138, how that would be handled or not. Um, sorry, water mains and other utilities, s still having to work through and make sure we're meeting the accept acceptable improvements the Stoughton Utilities would require. Outlot three, outlot three is this public dedication of parkland as part of the plat. What we're doing is we're identifying what that would satisfy for the number of dwelling units per our code that that would, would accommodate. As you'll recall, the senior housing development that's under construction right now would, account, would account as 100 dwelling units towards that credit. So that's 
articulated needs to be fully vetted out as part of the development agreement. We know that the town and the city will have to enter into an agreement um, that authorizes the improvements to the town roads connecting back to US Highway 51. Um, we know that that would be necessary to occur. Um, this outlines some of those expectations as part of that discussion, what we might see in, in those improved areas of the town. Um, number six, a notation informing pr prospective buyers of the obligation to pay park improvement fees to the city at the time a billing permit is issued. Number seven, another fairly standard one, all unpaid special assessments against the lands within the plat must be paid before the city will sign the plat. Then there's the ordinance reference to the rezoning. So hand in hand, we anticipate the zoning entitlement to occur as along with the, the final plat signing. Um, and then we need confirmation from the Capillary Regional Planning Commission that it complies with their standards uh, as part of the urban service area amendment. And then lastly, uh, reimbursement of all the expenses associated with the plat. Um, Matt and I, worked on the, this draft. Uh, Matt, did I speak too quickly on some of these or not spell out something well enough at this point? I think you did a, <clears throat> you did a good job on it. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Seltzer. Thanks. Um, let me just ask reimbursement of all expenses relating to the plat is that reimbursement by whom to whom um, and which are you talking about the drawing of the entire plat and all the planning or what it's related to the areas uh, encompassed under this final plat costs that the city would incur like outside consulting services and the like we seek those reimbursements to be paid in full and is there a number there? Are these reimbursements are going to be provided to us by the developers? Uh, we bill them upon invoicing from our outside consulting firms, and we make sure that that's fully paid prior to the signing of the plat. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Any other questions at this point, or? Anything you want to add regarding the resolution, Matt? No, I think Rodney summarized it well. Okay. You'll you'll recognize that this one and the next one are linked, in, in, intertwined, if you will, but they are separate actions. Uh, but certainly, we could have questions on the substance of any of them if we need to. Okay. So, if you don't have any questions, then we're looking for a recommendation to the council. I guess the recommendation would be to approve the conditions as outlined in the resolution. Uh, you're taking action actually on the resolution itself. I think it, the, the, the motion, if, if, if you agree with uh, the resolution as drafted, the motion would be to uh, recommend that the council adopt the resolution as drafted. Okay. Is there a title to this resolution? If I'm going to make that motion, how do I refer to this resolution? Is it because I don't see the file number just says R2019? Yeah. <coughs> we, we would refer to it as the con resolution conditionally approving the final plat of Kettle Park West North Edition. Okay. So as it's as included in the, on the agenda. <laughs> okay. Is it I, I so move that. <laughs> okay. Is there a second? Second now. Second by Schumacher. And any discussion on it? Uh, Commissioner Seltzer. Thank you. Um, I, I hate to drag up something that could be a problem, but have we ever decided anything on this roundabout that was supposed to be installed on 138? Um, as far as who's paying for it and how it's done, I think we ended one meeting saying, that it, that it was free for us to go ahead, not free monetarily, but we were free to go ahead with it. 
Uh, originally, was that not supposed to be something included? And has that issue been resolved? How, how is, it, is that roundabout being put in, or is it being left as sort of a dead end at the end of that street? I I'll speak it, to that. Yeah. No, it hasn't been resolved. Um, the original intent of that was to have that done before anything else was was moved forward in phase two. Somehow it was morphed by by the city administration to be, ah, we can do that later, kick it down the road. And when they get more, um, when they get more units and they become more profitable. Um, I would say I'm that. I'm not too happy about that. Uh, there's other members of council who are not too happy about that. Uh, but it is something that is being pushed. And that's where it's at. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe council took action on, on that particular item. Well, well, there is a there is an agreement with the DOT related to that yeah, aspect. There's an, the DOT. There's an agreement with the DOT. And the conversation at the council basically went um, at a point where, you know, there's a feeling that that work needs to be completed, um, it could be done. So we have the agreement to do it, and really it's a question of the timing of it. Currently the, the traffic really doesn't justify the need. We've identified it as a potential convenience and public safety issue over the long haul. If you look at what's being proposed, that's really the last phase of the development. And the thought would be is, is to delay action on what that intersection would look like until we see how the, de how the development unfolds and how the traffic situation flows and whether or not there's any development to the west of where the roundabout would be. Um, or it could be a right in, right out. We have the option. And the concern is, is if we were to um, go forward and let's say put a right in right out now we may turn around in five and ten years and say well now we want a roundabout and then we'd have to turn around and spend additional money and do it twice so we really haven't made a recommendation to staff to go forward with with the construction of that we've been focusing our efforts on oak opening and deer point and trying to get the intersection at roby road cleaned up in conjunction with the work that the DOT wants to do on the roundabout. That's really been our area of focus at this point because we feel that's more of a public safety issue than the 138 connection. Well, <clears throat> if I could, I'm, I'm thinking more of the financial aspect of it. Um, I believe we awarded a $5 million TIF fund to this company. And at that time, there was a roundabout drawn on the plat. And now it's been erased and we're moving on without getting it done. So I'm, unless I'm making some, I mean, this seemed to be a major issue at the time. And are we just, um, I don't see how we're establishing any fiscal responsibility for this. Um, so did we just step aside and say, go ahead? Or um, I, I thought that was part of our original agreement and I thought it was part of the original funding then I may be totally wrong but Th that roundabout was not part of the original funding package okay the roundabout that is on 138 was part of the original TIF funding. the one that actually leads into Walmart oh, sure yeah that one I know. the temporary lights um, that are at 51 and 138 the uh, signals that are at Jackson Street and some of the on-site uh, stormwater type improvements those were what was covered under the first phase TIF. This intersection here that you're referring to was not part of that. It was anticipated that that cost would be incurred somewhere down the road. We don't really feel a need for it at this point in time, but we do have an agreement in place when we feel the need is there. Um, we can have that conversation and figure out what that intersection would look like and who will be responsible to pay for it whether it's the developer, us, or perhaps even the DOT, we just don't have the answer to that question yet. I, I find that, well, and I don't want to be difficult about it. We've had enough difficulty about it, but it's a little bit putting the cart before the horse because that drawing and that roundabout was planned in there, and somebody had planned the expenses. 
and now we're talking about we haven't settled that, we're going to go ahead without it, you know who's going to pay for it. We're either going to pay somebody for it. And I, th I mean, am I totally off base in thinking that a year ago this was a major, um, you know, this was part of the plan that we were trying to assess the cost of? Well, it's always been in the comprehensive plan, and I think at least part of my debate before I became mayor was to make sure it was still included in the plan and as reflected on the drawings and that we had an agreement in place so we could do the work at the appropriate time. I just don't feel that now is the appropriate time to do that. If we do it now, more than likely there's going to be a TIF request to pay for it. If we wait, um, perhaps there'll be enough increment or enough money generated from the developer to pay for it or best case scenario. It could end up like the Roby Road roundabout where the DOT finally decides it's their responsibility and they end up paying for it. So I don't really feel that it's really the return on investment is there for us to do it right now or for us to ask the developer to do it. it there's just not going to be enough traffic um, until we get to the latter stages of phase two and possibly phase three where it'll really become an issue where we need it. If I could, and then I'll just let it go, but I think you said something along the lines of um, if their profit is great enough, they'll be able to do it. I've never heard of a development company ever in the history of ever saying, well, we made enough money, so we're going to do a four or $500,000 project for you um, because we figured out our finances, you know, we're ahead of the game. So here's $400,000. It's a million plus. I think we've lost the opportunity to have that done. And I don't understand how it got taken out of the equation. And now we're sitting there saying we're going to do it in the future, but who's going to do it? And we'll see how much money everybody made and work it out. I'm, I'm sorry, that's, I don't see that as a good way to contract a project, although you know, I'm, I'm glad everything has worked out with it, but I think leaving that roundabout out there, which was planned, at some time somebody erased it. And I don't think we're ever going to be called by any contractor to say, hey, we made so much money, we're going to just put it in for nothing. I hate to throw a shadow on the whole thing, but it's okay. fine. Just a clarification for because some of the stuff was decided upon before I joined the commission, but was it ever proposed or in writing that the developer was going to pay for that roundabout that was in the plan? No. I mean, it was, was, was the funding of that roundabout ever identified <coughs> or tied to the developer versus this is our vision for the development as a whole, it will eventually include a roundabout versus specifying who was paying what? It may have been identified as an off-site cost but it would be a TIF eligible type expense. Okay. Like the roundabout that has been put in. Correct. Yeah. Matt had something. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I would just add two things. One, the resolution that you have in front of you tonight, um, paragraph uh, 4B, does make it clear that there will need to be language in the development agreement that says that all you know, although it, the connection with 138 is not required to serve this north addition, um, the resolution says that there there will need to be language in the development agreement that requires the developer to acknowledge that uh, the city is not required to approve a final plat or a CSM for any further phases in this development. Um, unless it says unless provision is made for the construction of the intersection of Oak Opening Drive and 138 in a manner that's satisfactory to the city. Now that doesn't say how that has to be resolved but I think that's an issue for the City Council to decide how that will be funded. It's not really a plan commission issue it's a City Council issue um, and which is my next point which is I think I think the issue for the plan commission is really more a matter of from a from a land use standpoint and a layout standpoint are you satisfied with this uh, when it comes to the question of who's going to pay for stuff? I view that more as a city council issue than a plan commission issue.
Well, I just respond to that to saying that who's going to pay for it is not a minor point. It's it's uh, agree. And I can't imagine <clears throat> again a developer deciding, well, we'll pay for it. What the heck? We had a good time doing this. Doesn't usually happen. I don't think anyone expects that to happen <laughs> here either. Well, no I don't know that anybody expected that we would pay for it either. I don't think it's been resolved. I certainly think there was some acknowledgement that there might be TIF increment available to fund all the improvements off-site and on-site related to this development. All right, any questions on any of the other aspects of the resolution? Okay, so we have we have a motion, right? In a second. Right. Yes. Okay. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. Uh, one abstention. Okay, so that motion carries. That will go to the council. Takes us to item 11, which is a request for the certified <coughs> survey map. And we're also looking for a recommendation. Uh, what do you have? Certified survey map. Um, <coughs> exhibit is on your screen much like the previous one a resolution has been prepared articulating what we believe are some conditions that are appropriate for uh, this certified survey map to be considered for approval um, the first one is this public corridor or this outlot one which would be the future right-of-way connection to state highway 138 would be dedicated to the public or dedicated to the city um, as I previously spoke, outlot two in this case would not be uh, dedicated to the city at this time. It's part of the stormwater management. Um, it would be part of a larger discussion as, as future phases were contemplated. Um, development on lot one, so this is the large adjacent parcel to State Highway 138. Um, we're recommending that it be deed restricted to not allow development on this parcel until such the time the connection to State Highway 138 has been addressed to the satisfaction of the city. The zoning ordinance to amend this uh, zoning to institutional. Again, uh, standard language about CARP-C, uh, Capital Area Regional Planning Commission, confirmation of the urban service area requirements, and then also the language about reimbursement of expenses to the city. Any questions or comments on this one? By development of outlot one, that's just talking anything structural, correct? So, yes, their overall plan anticipates residential units on there. This is prohibiting that type of construction to occur on lot one. Okay. Will they be, at least in this phase, wasn't it suggested that they would move fill in there to bring that grade up to 138? Yeah, that, this isn't written in our interpretation to mean grading couldn't be accommodated in that, but it. certainly no structures. Got it. You'd, you'd agree with that interpretation? Yeah, the, the specific language of the deed restriction, we haven't drafted that right. yet, but we can certainly draft it to accommodate yeah. the grading but ex prevent buildings from going up. Any other questions or comments or anybody willing to make a recommendation to the council? Um, if I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get the wording correct. Uh, I'll move that we approve the certified survey map for Kettle Park West Phase 2 North Edition. Is that correct? Is that what we're looking at? Uh, no, it should be a motion to recommend that, motion the, council, to recommend. that the council adopt the resolution okay. conditionally approving the certified survey map associated with Kettle Park West. That's an oh, there it is. Good. Yes, I'll move that we um, that the common count that the yes we recommend <laughs> that the council that recommend. adopt the resolution conditionally approving a certified survey map associated with Kettle Park West. Yeah. Okay. Is there a second on that one? Second by Robinson. Okay. 
Any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. And one abstention. Okay. Um, that carries. Number 12 is a request to do a whole lot of rezoning, and it's all listed on the resolution there. I'm not going to bore you with reading it all. I'll let Rodney do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the essence of it, the residential component that I identified on the top of the page or top of the plat is to be SR5 which is single family residential five. The other outlots were to be rezoned from RH to institutional related to the stormwater management and the park dedication area. And it, that encompasses parcels both within the plat and within the CSM that we've just previously taken action on. The ordinance is drafted and I'll just quickly hi highlight these before the public hearing. Um, there's some conditions that we also suggest related to the rezoning ordinance and they're found here um, essentially um, I'm sorry <laughs> it, it just enumerates the zoning classifications that we're looking for in, in conjunction with the plat or that they're requesting in con concert with the plat being signed and the certified survey map being approved and signed Okay, any questions before we do the public hearing? Seeing none, we'll close our regular and then we'll reopen for a public hearing. And there's nobody signed up to speak, but if anybody would like to speak on this issue, uh, come on up. Oh, we have a couple people. They're running to the podium. And just, if you could just state your name and address again for the record, we'd appreciate that and let us know what's on your mind. My name is Gary DeBork. I own the property right next to it, 3302 State Road 138, where the connection would be made for the, where the round, where you're talking about the roundabout. Um, and it looks like to me that the easement is directly adjacent to our property. Um, so I'm really concerned about how all that's going to work because of the drainage you're talking about raising the grade. So that means our lot would probably flood or have water standing on it which now everything directly drains down into the pond um, the there's a very deep ravine um, which our property is adjacent to the the property line runs right in the bottom of the ravine and so i don't know how you would make a connection to 138 without filling the entire ravine in without building a You'd have to build probably a 15 to 20 foot high retaining wall <coughs> in order to make it work. Um, and nobody's talked to us about it yet. And so I, I really don't understand how the whole thing's going to work and that connection and how it's going to affect our property. At one time, it was my understanding that mm -hmm. DOT would approve it, but you had to remove our driveway. So how would we get to our house? You know, and so there's a lot of questions that I don't, I haven't ever heard anybody answer. And I, before you approve it, I really think some of that stuff needs to be addressed. Okay. All right. Thank you. And is there anyone else that wishes to speak? And you can state your name and address again for the record. Uh, Dennis Stankraus for Development Group, uh, Verona, Wisconsin. Um, on the zoning changes, I think this is this is just in. Uh, it, it shows what our comp plan was, or not our comp plan, but our concept plan that everybody's seen, probably over the last six months, just enforces that that zoning that was shown in there, and. Um, we're looking to get that moving along with that that north addition which is where all the final approvals are coming um, we certainly understand there's some challenges and questions as far as extending the road down to 138 at some point in time we've not looked at that to solve all the problems but we have some ideas and uh, you know as we move that way and need to get that built we'll certainly do it 
with uh, with the least impact to any neighboring parties there that that need be. If you know we we can't go on that property or we can't you know eliminate or pond any water on the property either. So I'm sure we can get work through that. That basically all right now drains to the pond and we don't plan on on uh, blocking any of that drainage way through there. So. Um, any other questions? I'm happy to answer them for you at any point here tonight. Thank you. Anybody else wish to, wish to speak during the public uh, hearing portion? If not, we'll close it and then reopen our regular business. And I guess I just had a kind of a process question, Rodney, is related to the, the stormwater and the grading. Is that something that we do or CARPSI does or how would all that work when we get to that point? All those plans have to be submitted and reviewed. Uh, consulting engineers review them. CARPSI plays a role in the extension of sewer and water. They have to also review it for compliance to um, the extension of sewer and water and the grading has to be taken into consideration related to the stormwater management plan that was approved for out here. So there's a number of groups and agencies and consultants that do have to review those types of improvements before they can take place. So as well that, would be, that would be something that they would just do or it's in a developer's agreement or what is our responsibility to make sure that happens? Well there's language in, go ahead. Well there, there, there are different layers. So one layer would be the construction plans for, for example, putting in a public street. So that would be city engineering review. And so, for example, if there's grading work and building a street that may have an impact on surface water drainage, they're going to have to account for that and deal with that. Um, and I can tell you, uh, given the we weather we've had around here for the last three years, all the engineers that I deal with are pretty well in tune with that at this point because every, every failure to do a good job over the past 50 years is now obvious to everyone. <laughs> In Dane County, I mean, any anywhere where there's a problem, we see it. Um, so that's one layer of review is the construction plans. The other would be the uh, stormwater management plan and, uh, approval process. Which, so we don't have a stormwater management plan for this area, right? And there'd be a stormwater management plan for the North Addition, mm -hmm. but not for the whole plat yet. Is that correct? Or a lot of the plat has already been analyzed yeah. and evaluated with. The CARP C submittals in the past. Oh, so so the, some of the stormwater improvements that are already in were designed to accommodate this yes. area from a from a and to, and to grow as basis. part of these these plat expansions. Okay. Correct. All right. So some of the stormwater planning, particularly from a, the man, the standpoint of like meeting um, stormwater detention requirements, for example, have already been addressed. We're probably really down to more in the detail of construction plan review at this point. Is that fair, Rodney? Certainly, um, in reinforcement. Uh, construction plans also in this case would have to be reviewed for the connection to State Highway 138 would include the DOT. DNR plays a role in review of grading plans as well. So there's an extensive process. Yeah, and I, I don't recall, and you were at more meetings than I were with the DOT. Did we have any of these discussions back then as far as the fill and the drainage, or was that premature at that point when it, we were trying to get the agreement? It was understood that those have to be worked through as part of the design for that connection. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since it's come up at, as part of this public hearing or the earlier public hearing, uh, I guess I just have a, a, a question about, I, I know the plan commission should be thinking more about design than funding, but I could see how funding of that particular connection is going to affect design in the sense that um, if, for example, the city is funding it, then the, the, the range of choices on how you would accommodate that connection without impacting neighboring properties might be different than if the developer was funding that particular connection and could not impact the adjacent property at all and had, every, had, had to solve everything on site. Um, then you might have to go with a retention wall, for example, to have the, the, the connection be at the appropriate grade. So um, I'm just going to ask, I, I know it's, I think it's important from a design perspective to know connectors like this, typically how are they funded? 
I mean, is that typically a, a, a developer investment because it's internal to the development, or is that a city investment because it's a connector that becomes a city street? Um, the previous connection to State Highway 130 was part of a TIF, TIF program. Okay. It was included in this TIF district. It was offset with TIF increment dollars for that, okay. that improvement. And, and I can tell you in the first phase, the, the TIF was fronted by the city. Yes. And since then, we've reviewed our TIF policies and the pay go where the developer puts up the, the front money to do the public improvements uh -huh. is uh, pay go is the preferred model that we want to use going forward. So if there's an investment to be made through TIF, the developer would make it and then would be reimbursed for that investment through the new property taxes that are generated out of the buildings that would go up. So it wouldn't, wouldn't be on the city's books at all. Okay. If, if the council agrees to that. Sure, right. But we have reviewed the policy since the first phase. Because so. if, if, it, if there is a, a significant ravine or drop-off on the gentleman's property that's adjacent that comes down, and you're talking, and I've always been, and I, again, this is a problem I think we often have. I was thinking about filling on the development side. And you can't just fill on one side. I can see why it's good to know what happens on the other side of the property line in terms of also filling up to the same level. And I honestly had not been thinking about that. So I think it's important for us to at least understand from a design perspective what kind of impact this is going to have. And again, I don't. Of, what's that? Did you see the back side of the Walmart? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that, again, the, the resolution in front of us is primarily a zoning code issue, but it came up within the public hearing. So I just want to make sure that I'm starting my process of thinking along these lines, because it's going to come up later uh, as we look at design options for that connector. Um, and, and I would just add, really, they have approved zoning. And really, the changing the zoning isn't really, I don't think, is really going to affect the design of that e anyway, is it? I mean, really, all we're doing is building a different type of unit, which I don't know if it'll have any effect on drainage or stormwater or anything else. Remember, this this doesn't create a, a developable zoning. <laughs> uh, lot 1, or uh, I'm sorry, Lot 1 still remains RH. So it, you, you can't create your multifamily development on that parcel of land as part of this, the zoning that would remain in place on that piece of land. Gotcha. The, the other thing I would say that it's been my experience that um, when a city is, is approaching a project like this, it, it's putting the design question first and the funding question second. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, what I've seen is that um, you know, the, the design considerations take priority first. How, what's the appropriate design? And then the second question is, how does it get, how, how, do, how do you address the funding? Whose responsibility is it to pay for things? Is TIF going to be a, a part of it? So I would assume that would be the way this would go as well, that the plan commission and the council and the engineers and so on, their first priority would be what's the appropriate design. Now, is it possible that funding considerations will influence their thinking? Yeah, it's possible because there may be, you know, trade-offs to make. If we do this design, it's this. If we do that design, it's that. But, um, you know, those. So they may well be a factor, but it's not going to be dispositive. I, I would say. Gotcha. Any specific questions about any of the zoning or, or the outlet in the stormwater system or? the park or anything like that. <coughs> I mean, I think that the park portion of it was pretty well received by the Park and Rec Committee, having it outside and having more of a linear type park um, with some trees and some terrain versus the, the initial plan that we had where it was in the middle of the subdivision. So I think that part was well received. Um, really didn't get much input as far as anything on Outlet 2 from anybody. If you guys have any thoughts about those or the zoning, uh, we'd like to hear about them. Um, otherwise, we're, we're looking for another recommendation. Go ahead, Phil. I guess I have a, I'm not sure where to ask this question in this process, but since there's a 
from what I understand, there's a general stormwater management plan design as far as the, the pond or the kettle and then pumping facilities and infiltration or filtration fields and, <coughs> and then pumping overflow into the city system and discharging it into the river at some point. And is that, so since we're, we're kind of touching on this design and then associating with cost, I'm just curious at this point, and like I said, I'm not sure if this is the point to ask this question, if there's estimates of, it seems like a pretty elaborate system of pumping water and as Matt mentioned, you know, engineers that are now reassessing previous thinking regarding stormwater control, if we have estimates about the cost and who will, how that cost will be borne or who will bear the cost of those facilities and maintenance and all that thing going, going forward. You're talking about the installation or the, the maintenance? I heard maintenance at the end. Well, I guess are both, both actually. But if that's maybe you can just kind of oh, go ahead. Well, let me just also, and Rodney can help me with this. So where we are right now is that this stormwater management system that is a rather complex system. I believe it's all currently still privately owned and maintained. There is an agreement, a contract um, uh, that requires the owners of. Uh, a number of the parcels within this Kettle Park West development mm -hmm. to be financially responsible for, you know, the cost of maintaining those facilities. So um, that's where it is today from a maintenance standpoint. Um, so that I was just I just wanted to make that clear. There may be a, there may be a discussion and decision at some point about transferring that, but I think that the <coughs> expectation is that's not that's not on the table right now. The transfer of that responsibility. You have something you want to add, then, Dennis? Um, I guess I did, obviously we, that's what's happening at this point. We're we're uh, taking care of that system, managing it, and, and pumping it. Working with the city and Dane County Regional Plan Commission, to make sure it's sized properly. Um, you know, and, and we have. Um, there's, there's another piece of that system that's got to be put in at some point here during the process, and that's that force main that goes from 51 down to the Ohara River. And I guess we're looking at trying to tie that in and do it when uh, Jackson Street to the east there gets rebuilt. And I, I think, Rodney, you said that's sort of on the horizon for the next two or three years that that could potentially happen. 2022, so, 2023. Yeah, so that that's all something we're kind of, we're monitoring and uh, you know trying to work work with the city on that um, just a quick comment on on some of this and I, I know you know we're going to be back and do a, a, a whole TIF presentation and 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 look at the costs involved that are that are needed to put this project together but um, initially when we submitted something to the city well it's over two years ago uh, we had like 5.7 million dollars on offsite uh, improvements that we were looking for some help on uh, since since that time the deal the DOT has stepped up and they're looking at doing the, the intersection at Deer Point Roby and 51 there and that's that's probably going to take at least two million two to two and a half million dollars off the table uh, both the city and us as a developer and a, as we work through this and, and part of what our TIF presentation is is there's there's about three different things that we're looking for for the off-site payment of, of, of some of the work. But those, none of those have to be done like day one. Like that force main, it's got to be done, but there's probably a two or three year window to do that. By that time, we'll show you that even without any further development out there, there's going to be enough money generated through the existing TIF on the commercial side to let the city accumulate those funds and actually be able to pay that without borrowing any money at the time that those are, are due. And then, like the mayor was explaining, we do a pay-as-you-go TIF this time. 
the developer puts up all the money up front and, and the only way we get repaid back is by creating that increment. And I think if we get this residential component, besides filling up a couple of vacant lots on the commercial yet, you're gonna be uh, presently surprised at what kind of uh, payback the city's gonna get out of the TIF, let alone have, you know, and you know, we're projecting right now probably in excess of $125 million of tax base that's created out of the Cattle Park West uh, project there. So, okay, did you have any follow up on you were talking about the stormwater, Phil, or anything else on that? I uh, think what well, so at this point facilities for stormwater control involving the, the current pond out there there's already pumps yep that are moving excess stormwater up to that north filtration mm -hmm. field and part of this <coughs> north plat actually expands that infiltration basin on the northern end and they've demonstrated there isn't a need to have the overflow force main installed as part of this I mean the the stormwater calculations and the operation of it has been functioning properly at this point and the expansion would accommodate the small addition to the area that's proposed as part of the North Platte. Here I'm going on water again. It's all right. And all, when, what year did they do all the hydrological assessment in that? They've been reassessing it as part of this this review as well. Okay. okay. So it's not sitting stagnant. Right. Um, Carp C, as indicated in the conditions of both the previous resolutions, has to be involved in the review and confirmation of that material as well. And they've been in communication with them about uh, the revisions and the modeling, and, and the concern about the rainfall intensities and um, events that have been occurring. And they did reassess by having. We should technically have more impermeable surface by changing the, some of the zonings. So they are certainly evaluating the entire new system based on um, the comprehensive plan amendment that's being contemplated as well. So land use changes, the differences in pervious areas related to each of those land uses. So they're certainly refining it based on the current information available. Okay. And they're satisfied that what we've got proposed is adequate for handling all of the above I mean we're, we haven't approved any construction plans related right, to right. phase two um, but we're certainly mindful of those and are aware of what what they've been in the process of and we've received draft materials so yes we're certainly looking into all that stuff right okay. all right um, Any more questions on this? Otherwise, we are looking for a recommendation to council if we've satisfied all the concerns, or at least all the ones we can address tonight. Um, so we'd be looking for a motion. This would be uh, the rec the motion would be to recommend adoption of uh, uh, the ordinance uh, providing for the uh, changes to the zoning classification of certain lands within the. Kettle Park West development. So moved. Motion by Robinson and a second. Second. By uh, Barman. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions on this one? That carries. Um, number 13, lucky number 13 is another request from Forward Development to consider adoption of the proposed comprehensive plan amendment related to Kettle Park West Phase 2. Um, any updates since uh, last time we talked about this? Uh, certainly, you'll see actually um, revised maps or supplementary maps that are included in your packet that articulate the um, amendments and additions to the comprehensive plan document that are being proposed at this point. This concept, uh, you're familiar with the concept in, in at least discussion purposes in the past. So this this is related to the land use and it would affect several maps. You'll note on the bottom of this particular one, um, this supplements maps 6A, 6B, 6C, and 6D. Those are land use maps consistent or in our comprehensive plan. 
So this takes into account the land uses of this particular area on those maps. In addition to that, the proposal would create, um, sorry for the scaling of this, two additional maps, 9A and 9B. And really what they look at in specific is the related transportation and improvements uh, related to this quadrant of the city. Um, map 9 it will remain that covers the balance of the city. This is intended to look at this particular quadrant of the city for these types of land uses. So that along with the narrative that is included in this packet um, titled Um, preliminary proposed amendment to the Stoughton Comprehensive Plan. You'll find in that narrative, you'll see areas that are additions, deletions, um, and the uh, additions and deletions of the specific sections within the existing Comprehensive Plan document. So that's what's before us as part of um, the request tonight. The action before the Planning Commission would ultimately make uh, the handed out resolution in front of you um, would be what you're acting on. It's really asking the Common Council to accept the draft document as the public hearing document. They would then s select a date for a public hearing related to the conference of plan amendment documents and then hold a hearing and take action on that document. Um, any questions at this point? Um, um, President Lasky. In C2, plan for new expanded and enhanced collector roads, you have removed width right of ways of 100 or, to, or 120 feet. Um, what's the reason for that? Yeah, uh, certainly we're trying to evaluate it based on the development proposed that's in those areas, and you'll you'll know that some sections of Jackson Street are currently 80 foot right of ways and that, that's the extension of Jackson Street in some cases. That's one of my issues that I always have had is that our right of ways seem to get squeezed uh, to accommodate a developer instead of the developer accommodating the city plan. Uh, we end up with um, terraces that are too small for planting of trees, we have less maneuverability for um, collection of snow, we have less maneuverability for utility <coughs> corridors. I do not want to see us moving to smaller right-of-ways so that we can accommodate uh, a development when the development, we have set standards and there's reasons that we have those in our ordinances. Um, this has been an issue that I've had for a long time. As a matter of fact, I believe that our, our right-of-way should be actually bigger so that they accommodate a wider terrace uh, so we have better latitude in the future instead of uh, shrinking things down. We have this in a number of places on in C2 yep. where we're removing uh, the east-west commercial collector, the east-west commercial collector again. Um, if you look through it, there's a number of spots where that happens, and I'm not real thrilled about that. Okay. As it's proposed, it doesn't doesn't. But this is something that you're asking us them. to recommend. As, uh, as again, as. it doesn't say that it can't be wider. It says as required by the city. I would like it to be required by the city that it, that it be what it's is, what they should be. Not it could be smaller. Commission can take action on. Yeah, um, certainly you can make that part of the recommendation. Part of it, yeah. Is this something that um, was drafted by us or from the developers? Uh, how did this part come to be? Well, certainly it's consistent with the concepts that have been been viewed by the, the commission and discussed with the commission over the last six, eight months. So can you just highlight the for, area? For example, um, Jackson Street in this section right away is 80 feet. This would allow for that 80 foot extension of Jackson Street through this location. Also, Oak Opening Drive, likewise, supposed to be 80 feet, I believe, an 80 foot wide right away in this general area as well. So, um, that's 
So if we were to... What, what are our standards usually? We don't have any subdivision. Um, well, I, I won't say. In the city limits, the widest right-of-way that I'm aware of is 80 feet. That's not to say that a DOT right-of-way might not be wider, but Jackson Street, um, Roby Road, Lincoln Page, um, Lincoln Page, Milwaukee. Page, might, Page might, Milwaukee, those are 80, 80 foot wide, just to give you some characterization of what we have. I can't picture one where there's 100, 100 or greater with the exception of possibly part of the four lane Main Street near Jerson Street, there might be an odd section there that runs through that area. So on the two lane, we're talking bike trails or any parking or what do we? You know, that always becomes the, the topic of every development. Uh, what improvements are competing for all the same interests? Um, stormwater management factors in, trees, um, pedestrian bicycles, um, all, all those things, um, sidewalks, we have to, in, in a lot of it can be offset if you reduce parking, on street parking. <clears throat> and you can, can accomplish some of your wider terrace widths if you have parking on one side and not the other, um, bike lanes, um, maybe a shared use path in a, as opposed to on street facilities. But having to have that discussion about what the intentions are in those developments is certainly part of the, the discussion for each location. Anybody else have any thoughts on, on that particular issue before we move on to anything else? Anything you guys want to add or? Come on up, Jim. Uh, Alderman Cabrera Miller. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, looking at one of the maps, um, it has Jackson Street and what's the other one? Oak opening as uh, having a planned pedestrian bike path, but not on this map. And this is from our city of Stoughton comprehensive plan, not having it. I don't see the yellow planned on road bike lane on those and I just want to make sure that the dimension of that or which segment are you speaking to um, well am I in the right area uh, yes okay Jim can you speak to okay um, first of all on, on the first part of this conversation was on the right of ways that we were talking about the intention was to say at a, the very minimum is an 80 foot watt right of way for all collector streets and that's on uh, in the last paragraphs of the those strikeouts and additions to that section 2c or something um, the key phrase in my mind when I was contemplating how to best deal with it is to uh, establish these collector streets with appropriate right of way widths to accommodate projected traffic so the right of way, the capacity of the street is really related to what the projection of the traffic coming out of the adjoining land uses would be, as well as it's kind of, it fits into the network, the whole transportation network. So conceivably, depending on what happens, like in these purple areas that you see on the map, the intensity of develop, land development in those cases could demand a much wider right of way, depending on the traffic characteristics that are projected and, and as the conversation and discussions go with the city as to what is actually going to be permitted in those areas. That's the one I was trying to make it much more flexible because the plan discussion right now, the existing map nine, you know, identifies 120 foot here and, and here and 80 foot here and 100 foot here and also doesn't recognize the existing uh, town perimeter town roads, the section roads, Star School Road as well as Rutland Dunn Town Road as being essentially part of the collector system when the whole thing is when all of a sudden done. So those, we're trying to make this kind of recognize what's happening and to make it as flexible as possible for the city and the developer to, and a developer to deal with land use in various locations. Now as far as on street, the collector street standard in my mind was always uh, travel lanes, you know, generally at least two, one in each direction, 
plus an on-street bike lane, plus a determination of whether you wanted parking on that street or not. And that's really, again, driven by the adjoining land uses. Uh, in some residential areas, it's certainly appropriate to have on-street parking. Uh, in some of the commercial areas, depending upon truck volumes, uh, travel, total volume of traffic and capacity, maybe you don't want on-street parking. That's a, it's a matter of trying to fine-tune it and give yourself the opportunity to evaluate it based upon the professional traffic, trip generation studies and traffic and impact analyses that get that are performed with all these developments. So that's that's really the design kind of framework that the comprehensive plan language is trying to create. But on, on, I agree with the provision having on-street bike lanes on collector streets. The question is really do you want parking? And that's really driven by the adjoining land uses. The other facility that occurs on the on the uh, on these collector streets, at least Jackson from the 51 to Oak Opening, and then Oak Opening to the length of Oak Opening, is having that multi-use path. And we had a conversation early on when we were talking about whether you extend that multi-use path farther west along Jackson Street, and the termination, or at least my recollection <coughs> and conclusion, was that because we had all these driveways from individual residences that would come out, that kind of creates a little bit of a more of a traffic problem. So it was better to create that recreational facility, that multi-use path, make it in a location that it wasn't going to conflict with driveways. That's why it's along residential frontages that are alley served and that they actually do connect to some recreational amenity or some other facility. That's why it comes down Jackson Street and turns left and gets over to the park eventually continues down to whatever facility gets built along Highway 138 as it goes west. And to provide a loop connection, it also continues north on Oak Opening Drive to provide that alternative commuter route or to whatever land uses occur north of the, north of this particular project and are facilitated by Deer Point and whatever development occurs north of that. Any questions or follow-up for Jim on that? Um, we do have a looks like a public comment period on the agenda, so that's different than the public hearing. Yep. So if there's anybody that's here in the, in the audience that would like to speak to the public comment, um, you can certainly come up and, and voice your your thoughts with us. My name is Gary Dvorak. Um, I own the property to the north where Oak Opening is going to connect with, you know, continue on. And I'm not opposed to, you know, the connection or anything. What I would like to know, though, is how that connection is going to be made to the existing road because we have a 66-foot easement. It's not an 80-foot easement. If the center lines are going to be lined up with the 80-foot, then that will directly affect um, all the stormwater management for our storage units that we own on the north side of that, on the north end of that property. Um, and I don't know if that will bring us out of compliance. And we won't have the space to make those storage detention ponds any bigger. So that road, in my view, needs to be to the, not lined up with the center line, but it needs to be moved to the, I guess I'd call it to the right, so that we could stay in compliance because the land to the right going out is vacant. And the other, the other side of the road, there's no, there's no room for taking seven feet off of each side to make it an 80-foot easement. I don't think there's intentions of expanding the right-of-way north of the plat line at this point. Oh, so it's going to stay a 66-foot easement? It's a 60-foot wide dedicated right-of-way in the town, I think is still the so anticipated. It's 66-foot right-of-way. Right-of-way. Yep in the town portion at this point. Okay, so that, then you're not gonna do anything with that. I thought, I thought there's, you- there, There's improvements that are planned and, and for pavement and pedestrian, but it's not anticipated to expand the right of way to be 80 foot in the town. Okay, that's what, that's why was yep. my question. Not at this time. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead, Phil. No, that's 
a very good point that he brought up. So then that road, potentially in the future, when the extension beyond this, uh, that section of oak opening that isn't on this improvement that we're looking at is basically going to have to step down from 80 feet to 66 feet until the, the right of way would is made to improve it and there isn't any plan for those areas to come into the city at this I mean it's in the conference of plan but the city is not pursuing mm -hmm. those being converted to city that's going to make it kind of a funny well I think there's transitions going up there to the Roby there's there's area. transitions in other parts of the city whether it be sidewalks uh, the transition to a different right-of-way width or or even street segments where that that occurs um, again you've got a rural section in the town at this point we'd have an urban section in the city portion and we got to make it clear we're talking about right-of-way we're not yes. talking about street surface that's so correct. street surface could be the exact same all the way through this it's just the right-of-way changes in terms of you know like the apron that we're talking about and where the extra bike lanes or those kinds of uh, amenities could yeah, be there's more likely curb and gutter uh, um, there would be in the city uh, there wouldn't be necessarily in the town right. but the pavement the travel lanes are really what you would focus on you'd have travel lanes that would accommodate the traffic and or pedestrians and bikes and how that would be designed through the rural section would be um, done within the existing right-of-way is my understanding that's correct there's no plans to widen the right-of-way of that section of Oak opening drive north of, uh, of uh, Kettle Park West what will happen is the the road itself will the pavement itself will taper down to the existing kind of town section town road section and that whole question about how it gets up to Deer Point and then turns over towards where the roundabout is is what we, the city and everyone is talking trying to coordinate that design project for that roundabout and how it transitions into the the, the street design of Deer Point and I think that that'll be a discussion with us the developers and the township and we've had some initial conversations but we're really getting to the point where we need to probably ramp up those conversations and obviously they're gonna want to have some say in the matter because it is their road as well so um, we would certainly bring back any feedback or information from the, the townships that might, if they have any thoughts or concerns on what that might look like as well. Was there anyone else that wanted to speak for the public comment portion? Okay. Um, are there any more questions or thoughts or information you'd like to see either now or at a future meeting? Otherwise, um, we're looking for another recommendation and how should this one read? It's related to the resolution that was at your place tonight. Yeah, so we we're recommending adoption. Of okay, this did everybody see the resolution then that was here when you came in? Or is it buried with this amount of paperwork that we have? <clears throat> well, we could just take a second and read over it again and see if you have any questions on the actual resolution. Um, I imagine, Sid, uh, Matt, did you help draft this one or was this one that Rodney did? It's one that we did based off the last conference of plan amendment. Can we call it up? Because I lost it in my shuffle sure. of papers yep. here. There's basically five sections on it. Thank Does everybody else have a copy of it? Okay. Anything that jumps out at any of you, or do you want us to walk through it, or what would you like us to do? I 
And there it is. Do you just want to run through it quick? Um, sh sure. It outlines the statutes of the um, comprehensive planning statutes and the city um, statutes that outline this. Um, the pr adopted written procedures to foster public input and public participation. Um, the Council and Planning Commission have been exercising that. Um, the prepared amendments are included as part of this would be the attachment A of the documents that were contained in tonight's packet related to this item. Um, and then it's recommended the plan commission um, has or recommends the council adopt a resolution to accept the documents as a public hearing draft. Once the public hearing draft is available, then that's put on um, notice for I believe it's at least 30 days before the council can hold a public hearing related to that amendment process. Is that anticipated to be a joint public hearing, Rodney, with the planning commission and the council? Um, or? I don't know the answer to that. But there I don't would think be it's necessary. I don't think that it has to be. Is there an expectation that the council would? Well, let me ask you this: Is is this is the intent that that this approval of this resolution would constitute the planning commission's recommended that this be adopted, yes. and and accepted as a public hearing draft? Both. Yep. I don't think that's that. Could go down to section five. Well, what I find a little unclear here is it, it just says we're recommending that this that that the council adopt a resolution to accept the documents as a public hearing draft. It doesn't say that the plan commission is recommending that the council actually adopt this amendment to the comprehensive plan. Okay. Um, so I would add that if that's the intent, because there is a legal requirement yeah. that the plan commission actually recommend adopt a, a resolution recommending the plan. Let me get the statute. <clears throat> While he's looking at up, uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. sure. And, it, and it's just about my packet itself. And it, it, there's, I have two letters dated June 6, 2019. It almost seems like there was a duplicate printing. There was. Okay, there so was. this whole first section is just duplicated a second time. Yeah. Because I want to make sure I know what I'm approving to be yeah. put forth. So this, well, essentially, I can fair take. Fair point. So what you're acting on is the preliminary proposed amendment to the comprehensive plan document. Yep. With its cross stricken, I'm sorry, the actual amendments to the language are the C2 language. You see where it's cross stricken and underwritten? Yes. That's the language changes. Then you're going to have map, this uh, one map that's 6A, 6B, 6D. And then there's two map nines, 9A and 9B. That's the substance of exhibit A. Okay. So it's, it's really if I remove that first duplicate section, yeah. I'm sending forth this to the city council from that point backwards. I mean, without the cover letter type stuff, right. but yes. Okay. So the, the, the proposed amendments to the comp plan are those that are reflected in attachment A? Yes. Okay. So the only adjustment I would make is to say that the plan commission recommends that the uh, comprehensive plan be amended as provided in attachment A. And I guess we're having the public hearing before the council because that's what's required. Yeah. Yep. Be amended as 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 found in exhibit A. As, yeah. As provided in attachment A, or or that attachment A be adopted as an amendment to the comprehensive plan. Is 
Does that read better? Yes. Did everybody see the change then? He just basically wanted to make sure that we added the actual amendment into the resolution. Yeah, section 5 was a change, the altered Section 5. Yeah. And for your information, I know I've told this to the council. I don't know if I've told this to the Plan Commission, but the way the statutes are set up, the council can only approve what the Plan Commission recommends. So if, if, the, if the Plan Commission recommends attachment A, that's all the council can approve. The council can't say, well, we're going to make some adjustments to that and approve something different. Whatever you recommend is what the council's limited to. So they either will... It'll have to be an up or down. Up or down. Yeah. Okay. At the council. And if, it, if they vote it down, it'll probably come back here come back and with hopefully some direction. Could be. <laughs> Which may or may not have to be followed. Correct. Yeah. You can have a standoff. Let's hope not. Okay. So everybody understand what uh, the resolution says? Um, if so, I would look for somebody to make a motion to, to adopt this resolution. As amended. As amended, yeah. Well, the one that's written well, right here. The one that's written there. <laughs> Okay. There's a motion by Robinson. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second by Seltzer. You had me nervous there for a while. Um, are, are there any questions or anything that you'd like to see tweaked or anything or um, hearing none all in favor say aye. 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 aye aye any opposed none opposed any abstentions on this one all right that one carries that takes us to future agenda items um Sorry, I didn't prepare it. I don't, I'm not okay. aware of anything in particular. All right. If you guys have anything you'd like to see on the next agenda, let us know, and we'll uh, review where we're at. Um, otherwise, we're looking for that final motion. To adjourn. There it is. Is there a second? Second, yes. second by Caravello. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. <coughs> Thank you. So just. Uh,